What? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Tuesday, January 27th, 2023, Placer County Board of Supervisors meeting. We will begin with a flag suit salute led by Supervisor Jones. Our next item will be the consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda have been recommended for approval by the County Executive Department. The board will convene as the Placer County In-Home Supportive Services Public Authority Successor Agency for items 19A. All items will, will be approved by a single roll call vote. This includes items 12D, 12E, and 12F of the supplemental agenda. Anyone may ask to address consent items prior to the board taking action, and the item may be moved for discussion. Do any of my colleagues have any items on consent that they wish to pull off for discussion? I see none. Anyone in the uh, public would like to pull a consent item up for discussion? Mr. Carabinian. Good morning. Yes, item 17B, uh, New Parks, Agriculture and Resources Department. 17B? Uh, a, B. 17 A B. B like boy. <laughs> 17 B. Alrighty. Are there any other comments from uh, the audience that wishes to remove a consent item off for discussion? Seeing none, is there anyone online? I see none, Chairman. Alrighty, the board will entertain, entertain a, the chair will entertain a motion to approve the remaining items. I'll move approval of the consent agenda as amended. All right, it's, the motion has been moved by Supervisor Gore and second by Supervisor Jones. This is a roll call vote. Will the clerk please call the roll? Gore? Aye. Landon? Yes. Jones? Aye. Gustafson absent? Holmes? Aye. Now we'll move to item 17B. Uh, Mr. Garabedian, did you have something to comment to make? Thank you. Um, the issue here about including parks now in a new structure with agriculture and natural resources, uh, which are uh, all three are among my areas of interest, uh, especially the natural resources. I just I wanted to make some observations about the parks department. Uh, my first hearing here for the county was on the county's own proposal for the North Fork American River Trail. I went to that hearing on the negative declaration that B had said it was going to be an EIR. Anyway, I was heckled there, and that happened to be the first hearing I went to, and that happened to be my experience. Uh, but that park's uh, proposal um, has still hasn't been built. But now the most recent park's proposal that I've spoken on is the, the one for the, uh, the regional park expansion of trails. And um, there's something in common to both of these. On the first one, I called every month to ask when the EIR was coming out, and I was told not, net, not yet, not yet, until finally I was told that there's going to be this meeting on the EIR. Well, I was not too welcome. Uh, and then on the, this, the last meeting on the regional park, um, there, there was a, uh, there were, they, people were not told that there was a, a vote, a, a comment period at that time to the regional water board on that park. They were not told. They were just not fully informed about something going on where they could have commented. And I, I felt that was sort of the same kind of problem where the public is not getting their due or getting fully informed. And so I mean, I'm concerned about the, the, that kind of action, those kind of activities in Parks Department and how that will be managed. So thank you for this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Mr. Garabedian. Supervisor Landon, do you have a comment? No. No. Sorry. All righty. I guess we need to remove approval of uh, 17B. We need to take public comment on it. Oh, is there a public, any public comment on 17B? Is there anyone online? It appears there is. Oh. Anne, did you want to give comment on item 17B? I think I'm, I just wanted to do general public comment. Is oh. this one time? We'll come back to you for that. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're okay. Then. The chair will entertain a motion. So moved. And I'll 
second. It's moved by Supervisor Jones, second by Supervisor Gore. Uh, do we need a roll call on no. this? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Hearing none, the item is moved. We will now move to public comment. Persons may address the board on items not on this agenda. Please limit comments to three minutes per person since the time allocated for public comment is 15 minutes. If all comments cannot be heard within the 15 minute time limit, the public comment period will be taken up at the end of the regular session. The board is not permitted to take any action on items addressed under public comment. Good morning, Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer, Placer County. Uh, so here we are, number three this month, right? <laughs> um, so at our last meeting, um, last Tuesday, when we passed the Project 8 winery, a theme that kept coming up was we have to figure out how to preserve agricultural land, and um, we were doing all this to preserve agricultural land. So I have a, another idea for that. Um, it would be kind of going off an idea I spoke about two meetings back when we had our UCC extension here visiting and giving us their annual update. But I, I think we need to start creating a program that goes into our schools. Now I, I know California, the state, implements most of our educational things, but we do have some leeway to add things into our curriculum here in our county. So we have a really wonderful program that supports our ag families and our ag kids, but I think we have to bridge the gap between that and create programs for children and families that aren't a part of that culture so they can become introduced to it. I think uh, we lose a lot of our life skills um, in school, um, including science, which is really important for critical thinking. And by bringing in kind of botany, learning how to prune, learning how to plant, uh, learning simple things like what the bloom on an egg is for a chicken or a duck or whatever you have um, and, and why that's important. Um, I, I just think we're, we're not looking at maybe how we could bridge the gap because we need the non-ag people to appreciate and learn about what ag is as well um, to help bridge that gap. So um, again, I, I think in high school, having some kind of a um, college credit uh, program that would reach non-ag kids um, to entice them to take the class, that's why I'm saying college credit, maybe one unit or something like that, that anyone could take um, to learn these things and, and learn like wildlife fire mitigation and, and where our food comes from because we're very disconnected from where our food comes from. And I've spoke a lot about health. And when our bodies aren't healthy, our minds aren't healthy. And we, we have really just disconnected um, from that process. And the more processed foods we've eaten over the years, the more problems we're having with our health. So I, I think it would be something just to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Mr. Garabini. Well, good morning. A week, ago, a week ago, this board had the, the aforementioned hearing on the Winery 8 project. Now, we learned when the hearing started that uh, comments were going to be limited to two minutes. Uh, I was uh, expecting to speak for three minutes, as I think many of the people were. So this was a 33 percent, one of the three minutes reduction in the time the public could speak. And I would say that is a one-third reduction in democracy. Now, I'll explain. Now, we know that all someone has to do now in Placer County is have a bunch of people call in or write in and say they want to speak. And then so that now, we, there's a precedent now that they'll be limited to, to uh, two minutes and, and not allow the full three minutes. Just get a bunch of supporters of a project to call in and, and say, make so many that you're going to reduce the time people have to speak. So if 30 people lose a minute, that's 30 minutes of comments, facts you needed to know and to hear that you cut off from hearing at that meeting, unnecessarily in my view. Or even if it's 20 people, there's 20 minutes of time you're losing. So um, I think 
<laughs> there's, it's very important for you to emphasize and have time for the public to fully be able to express themselves. And I see this, th that limitation to two minutes as a political act, nothing but a political act. So um, now at least then, at least two of you spoke for more than two minutes. I just thought that was ironic. The public can only speak for two minutes, but then some of you could explain your comments in, in, for more than two minutes. So the public now knows who's who, what's what, and who, who isn't what. <laughs> uh, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garabedian. Good morning, it's, Chairman Holmes. I have got to comment on that. Yes, it's retired Placer County Supervisor District 3, <laughs> Area <of> White. <laughs> Two minutes is a long time to speak. <laughs> One minute is a long time to speak. Mm -hmm. Three minutes is quite a long time to speak. And most people repeat themselves during that time. It's not necessary. And the public is limited because you only have so much time in your day to hear people. You get to comment however much you wish because you need to understand what it's all about and so do your colleagues. So I appreciate what the gentleman said, but I think he's incorrect. Thank you. By the way, how long was that? <laughs> Is there anyone else wish to address the board uh, under public comment? Seeing none, is there anyone online that would wish to address the board? Please continue. Ann, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Hi, uh, good morning. Ann Nichols, North Tahoe Preservation Alliance. If you haven't had time to read the 100 plus page Tahoe stewardship plan put out by the TRPA, including 17 agencies. I wanted you to know that six of the entities that are promoting this are all tourism. Uh, Lake Tahoe Visitors Authority, Travel North Tahoe, Visit Truckee Tahoe are just some. The consultants are all travel people, Center for Responsible Travel, the Travel Foundation, Better Destinations. And then the hooker is Civitas. Those are the people that brought you the T-bid plan for Eastern Placer County, which taxes uh, bars, restaurants, and retail $6 million a year comes in, which is determined, the use for that is determined again by tourism, the North Tahoe Resort Association with their new name, uh, with on the board is Vail and Palisades and the Ritz. So uh, what we're doing is we're creating again another layer of quasi-governmental agency. The money, as I understand it, is going to be initially handled by the Tahoe Fund. And the kicker on this with Civitas is they plan a P-bid, which would be taxing real estate, taxing property, to pay for infrastructure and transit. And nobody knows about this. And I think it's extremely ill-conceived they are on LinkedIn today looking for someone for $118,000 a year to handle doing this. Um, you know, I have, have you guys signed on to it? I, maybe you have, I'm unaware of this, but uh, we intend, the North Tower Preservation Alliance intends to get the word out to the public about what's coming down the road. And I hope you will take a step back. This is ill-conceived and unnecessary. It's going to just create more, more, more. And as you've seen in many newspaper articles, we have way too much tourism already. I appreciate these people trying to protect their jobs and have uh, a way to monetize Lake Tahoe again. But really think about this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ann. Do we have anyone else on? No, Chairman. Um, already. Supervisor Landon. Yeah, just a quick um, response. I wanted to reply to Jennifer's comments and just say I 100% agree with you about getting kids onto working farms. I think it's really important to connect them to their food. Um, it's obviously kind of outside of our jurisdiction, but I do think there are some programs that exist in our local schools, but um, I would be happy to connect you with the superintendent, at least in my district, um, so you can maybe have that conversation because I think um, it's a great topic and it's something that's important. So just reach out to me. All righty. 
Seeing no more public comment, we'll now move to board member and county executive reports. Do my colleagues have any reports? Any reports over on this side? All righty. Uh, yes, county. Yes, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, yes. sorry a little slow to draw here this morning. Um, I just uh, want to report that last week um, I attended a uh, leadership graduation in Loomis. Hmm. And um, the former sheriff Ed Bonner was the speaker, and he's he's so impressive. I'm sure you all know that. Um, it was great to see all the graduates there. And then on uh, Friday we attended the State of the City in uh, Rockland, and Mayor Ken Broadway uh, gave the presentation. It's always an exciting and fun event if anybody ever wants to go and and visit. And then Shanti and I represented the Placer County Board of Soups um, on last Thursday at the ribbon cutting for the Placer County Fair. And of course, we had the hard duty of judging ribs on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> and they were delicious, yes, they were. weren't they? <laughs> yes, they were good. <laughs> and, and Jim, I, how could I forget you, Jim? Jim, Shanti, and I, we all represented the county. Right, thank, thank you. you. Okay. I wouldn't miss a good rib, rib cook-off. <laughs> Already, uh, our county executive officer has a report. Thank you, board chair. Uh, I just wanted to share with the board and with the viewing public that I had the great pleasure to lead a Placer delegation yesterday in Portland, Oregon, uh, for a national conversation about communities working together, local government, businesses, academia, to improve community quality of life issues. and. Uh, myself, Caroline Godkin of the CWI Institute up in Tahoe, Andy Fecco of Placer County Water Agency, and President Willie Duncan of Sierra College went up to tell our forest health wildfire story to a national audience who thankfully, given all the smoke back east in June, have a renewed appreciation for what we deal with every summer. So great conversation, hopefully more to come with more good things for Placer. Thank you. Alrighty, we will now move to, uh, we got a department item, uh, 5A, uh, this is agriculture, it is uh, forest restoration projects, master stewardship agreement modification number eight to the supplemental project agreement with the U.S. Forest Service. Carrie Trimmer, hello. Good morning. Hi, Chair Holmes and members of the board. Carrie Timmer here, your Regional Forest Health Coordinator, uh, riffing on the forest health and wildfire theme a bit further. Um, I'm here uh, this morning actually to discuss a new project opportunity that came to the county from the U.S. Forest Service. And this would be for some salvage and restoration work on the mosquito fire, a portion. So for context, as you know, the mosquito fire um, last year was Placer County's largest fire ever. Um, let's hope that stays that way and we don't have bigger ones than that coming. It was also, interestingly, the largest fire in all of California last year. Burned roughly 77,000 acres, um, caused the evacuation of roughly 11,000 people, damaged or destroyed 70-some, 80-some uh, buildings and structures with devastating impacts on our towns and towns also in El Dorado County. And so the Forest Service is planning a salvage and replanting project on roughly 4,000 acres that it manages, among many more acres, but these are uh, areas that are relatively close to communities. This is on Cuckoo Ridge, Deadwood Ridge, and other areas along the Forest Hill Divide and Mosquito Ridge Road. There's actually a, a map in your packet with a bit more detail. And so the U.S. Forest Service is asking for the county's support and help um, because they don't have the personnel to do this kind of emergency unexpected work. And so um, they're looking to the county to potentially manage pre-sale activities for sale of the burned timber, and then also to manage the work in the field. Uh, the vendors that the, for that the Forest Service would hire, but we, the county, and our contractors would manage, similar to the kind of services that we provide for the French Meadows project. And so this work is time sensitive, which is why there is this urgency to it, um, even though the Forest Service doesn't ha currently have the personnel to do the work themselves, for two reasons. One is safety, because these burned trees can, can fall uh, kind of quickly and unexpectedly. And so that can definitely affect visitorship and also the crews who might be working in the field. 
um, but also economic reasons. So the Forest Service has an agreement with SPI to take the timber that would come off of this project, um, but we have only about a year's window in which that timber has any value. So even though it's been burned, it does have value, it can be milled, but if it sits out there for more than a year, that value goes away. So these are the reasons that, um, that we have this urgency. And then the county came to us because we're, uh, you know, they view us as a respected partner because of our previous uh, work together. So in terms of how this request would work, as you know, the county has a 10-year master stewardship agreement with the Forest Service that authorizes us to do work on federal lands. And just like we do uh, with our French Meadows project, the way that we map out this work on a year-to-year -year basis is through the um, uh, SPA, the Supplemental Project Agreement. And so anytime new work, acres, budget uh, comes up in a, in a project setting, that Supplemental Project Agreement has to be modified. And so you very kindly modified one for us just a couple of weeks ago, I believe, for the French Meadows project. Um, but now because this is new work with new acres and new budget, um, we're asking you to do yet another modification, if you will consider that. Uh, and that, that modified SPA serves as our contract agreement and the mechanism to transfer the funds. So that's what's before you today, an additional modification to this supplemental project agreement. So the modification would cover the work that's necessary to prepare for the salvage sale. And again, as I mentioned, managing the vendors in the field. And the Forest Service would handle the actual sale and the hiring of those, those vendors. So that is not work that the, the county would have to do. The budget included in this SPA amendment is $700,000. And that covers county time, as well as the um, hiring of a registered professional forester who can devote time to this project and um, handle particularly the field management. So the project goal is to remove these fire damaged trees and ultimately to prepare for replanting. That's, that's where we're trying to get to is the, the ability to replant that area. And the Forest Service is focusing on this area because of its proximity to communities um, and also frankly because it, it is an area where um, the federal environmental compliance work has already been completed so it makes it easy to address that urgency, time, sensitivity in this particular area. So with that background, uh, staff is asking your board to approve and authorize the chair to sign modification number eight of the supplemental project agreement with the Forest Service, Tahoe National Forest, to conduct mosquito fire restoration work on behalf of the Forest Service, and to determine that the proposed action is exempt from environmental review pursuant to California Environmental Quality Act Guidelines Section 15269. So I'd like to thank you for your consideration and I'm happy to answer any questions. I, I don't have a question, but it's just part of the uh, ongoing process of our collaboration with the U.S. Forest Service, particularly on Fresh Meadows. We've proven ourselves and I am I'm fully supportive of moving forward with this. Any comments or questions from board members? I did know what you said. Oh, okay. <laughs> Supervisor Jones. Yes, I agree. It's um, forest restoration, clearing of all the dead, the debris and the old stuff and replanting is, is such an important role that we can take here. And um, I just wish they would revive the timber industry and let us you know, do a much better job than we're doing. But I thank you for your work on this. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone in the public wish to address the board on this item? I see none. Is there anyone online? I see none, Chairman. Already, then the board will bring it back. I move approval. Okay. I'll second. It's a motion by Supervisor Jones, second by Supervisor Landon. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? Hearing none, the item is moved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we'll go to item uh, 6A, Community Development Resource Agency, Consultant Contract Inspection Services, in um, Construction Inspection Services Agreement. Good morning, Michelle. Chair Holmes and members of the board. I'm Michelle Lewis with the um, Engineering and Surveying Division of the Community Development Resource Agency. I'm presenting for Alice Atherton, who's on vacation today. Um, I'm here, uh, the item before you, we are requesting that you authorize the purchasing manager to award a contract under the existing management services agreement um, for construction services for Plasher Ranch Development Phase One civil infrastructure in an aggregate amount not to exceed $600,000 
and execute any amendments and change orders in an amount not to exceed 10% or $60,000, and to approve and authorize the Community Development Resource Agency Director to execute a construction inspection services agreement with Gen California Placer Ranch LLC to fund consultant construction inspection services and a portion of the county staff time for inspection and project facilitation services. And lastly, to approve a budget amendment, that's amendment 00810 in the amount of $660,000 and determine the proposed action is consistent when the environmental impact report certified by the board in December 2019 and is exempt from environmental review pursuant to California Environmental Quality Act Guidelines Section 15309. So as a background on, um, in, uh, on projects that have uh, extraordinary magnitude, such as this Plaster Ranch project, uh, in order to prevent interruption of inspection services, we often, the county often evaluates and subsequent, subsequently contracts with consultant inspection firms listed on our qualified list with our procurement department. In this case for Placer Ranch, construction services are expected to begin this summer on the roadway work in Sunset Boulevard. The agreement between the county and Gen California Placer Ranch, which I mentioned above, provides funding upfront for the inspection services and therefore there is no additional impact to the general fund. I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, any questions, comments from board members? I see none. Uh, anyone in the audience have a question on this? Mr. Garabedian, please come forward. Uh, Mike Garabedian, Placer County Tomorrow. I don't remember any, uh, any of the funding amounts being discussed, though they were discussed without the amounts. Uh, Placer Ranch is, is not a good plan. And one proof of that is how when projects come along, you change it. Like you allowed the, the, one of the projects um, to be even closer to the, the uh, landfill. Um, the, 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 the crux of this was spelled out in detail in the Citizens Smart Growth Plan. This was prepared by an expert from the Rhode Island School of Design who had public meetings where the public could come as this plan was developed, from the, starting with the resources and the different alternatives and the ways to avoid the area that's now being destruct, destroyed by the Placer County Conservation Plan. PCCP, so you had an alternative, and what did the county do, but they hired a consultant to trash that alternative plan without really looking at it or, or, or giving it the, the work that it, it deserved. Now the Placer County Conservation Plan itself is, is in serious question, uh, the way it's working right now. The annual report has been pending and pending. It's not clear when it's gonna be done or what's going on with it. And, and just recently, the, um, the annual fiscal report was presented in slides for the first time. And I, I will be commenting on that to the Placer Conservation Authority because I raised a couple of points at their meeting and have, uh, have gone through that. Both of these actions suggest that the, the director, the, the person managing the, uh, the, the Placer Conservation Authority may not meet the qualifications for the job. If you look at the job description and experience and background, someone should weigh that against these pending projects. This person has a lot of experience with the plan from way back, but then in terms of implementing it, the people on that uh, Conservation Authority, two Board of Supervisors members, and one person from Lincoln, that's a Joint Powers Authority, they need to look very closely and not just meet every two long time, two months. There needs to be an active engagement in the fisc fiscal, what's going on there. It's not clear that the, the money, the costs for specific projects are gonna match up with their actual contribution to the co projects, for instance. I'm told they will be comparing for individual projects, the expenses and ink, but it doesn't, it's not clear they're doing that now. So the PCCP was already a bad project from the beginning. The, the, and the Placer, the Placer Ranch specific plan. So I think the, the two of them together are a real problem. And I think this project, this, this proposal to spend this money is not a good idea because of what I'm saying. So thank you for hearing me out. Okay, thank you, Mr. Garabedian. Is there anyone else in the audience wish to address the board on this item? Is there anyone online that wishes to address this? 
No, Chairman. There's no, all right, and then uh, we'll bring it back to the board for action. I'll move approval of the item as stated by Michelle. I'll second. All righty, um, it's been moved by Supervisor Go, second by Supervisor Landon. Will the clerk please call the roll? Landon? Yes. Jones? Aye. Gustafson, absent. Gore? Aye. Holmes? Aye, thank you, the item has been moved. Now we'll move to our 9.30 timed item, which is the Mosquito and Vector Control District presentation. Hello, good morning. good morning. Thank you for having me. I'm Megan Lovano. I'm the Public Information Officer at Placer Mosquito. I'm just going to be giving you our annual update. And since we have so many members of the public here, just revisiting some information about our district right in. So who we are, Placer Mosquito and Vector Control District, we're a special district. We're governed by California Mosquito and Vector Law. We have a seven member um, board of trustees, which with a member representing each of the different cities and towns within the county, and then one countywide representative. So for Placer County, Mary Holiday Hansen is our representative. We have 25 full-time staff members, and we also hire seasonal staff in the summer months and also interns. Our mission is to effectively and efficiently manage the risks um, from vectors and vector-borne diseases in Placer County to ensure um, a good quality of life throughout our county. This is a picture of all of our full-time staff, which is a very hard thing to do. Um, this is all 25 of us. Um, we monitor and manage the vectors and diseases in Placer County. Um, we communicate that risk to the public by giving presentations like I'm doing today and school outreach and other outreach programs that we have. We use integrated vector management tools like biological and physical control and applied research. And then we also make treatment decisions based on sound science. So we serve all of Placer County from Roseville all the way up to the Truckee and Tahoe Basin area. Each of the different areas of Placer County encounter different vectors and vector-borne diseases. So in Roseville, in that West Placer area, we see a lot of mosquitoes, different species of mosquitoes, and then we deal with West Nile virus. In the mid Placer area, that's kind of up here in Auburn, we also have mosquitoes, but we also do tick surveillance and we monitor for Lyme disease. And then up in East Placer, we work with yellow jackets and we assist the California Department of Public Health with rodents. So one question we've been getting a lot this year is how is record rainfall gonna impact mosquito activity? And at our district, we like to say if there's more water, we're gonna anticipate that there's gonna be more mosquito activity. As of right now in this season, we haven't seen a ton of impacts but come August, when we have our West Nile virus peak, we anticipate that there might be some significant changes in what we're seeing. Again, as of right now, we don't know what that impact might be, but we're gonna be monitoring, communicating that risk as we get closer to those August months. I included a screenshot of um, what we're hearing from the public. We have a public service request program where anyone from the public can go on our website and submit a problem report. And they have options of the type of problems that they can submit. It could be unusual mosquito activity, standing water problems, um, swimming pools. We, we ask people to, uh, to report green swimming pools. Also dead bird reports go through the state. So those go through um, westnile.ca.gov, the website, or through their call center. We also get yellow jacket reports and ticks. So for June, so far, we only have a few days left. We had 82 public service requests, a lot of those requests having to do with mosquitoes and standing water. So for standing water requests, most people are asking us for mosquito fish. <laughs> we have a mosquito fish program. We rear them at our office in Roseville. We will have our technicians go out and they will actually do an inspection of the standing water, whether it's a pond or a water trough, and be sure that mosquito fish is the right solution for that standing water. Mosquito fish eat mosquito larvae, and they do a really good job at it. So that's kind of how our program works, and it is completely free to the public. So some of the news at our district as of just these past two weeks is that we have detected West Nile virus in Placer County. 
So last week we found a mosquito sample in the West Park neighborhood and a dead bird nearby the West Park neighborhood kind of flanking it off of Blue Oaks um, that both tested positive for West Nile virus. This is not uncommon for this time of year. We annually detect West Nile virus in Placer County. For the state, and, and these numbers will get updated on Monday, but they're reporting that throughout California, there are 31 positive dead birds for West Nile and then also 31 mosquito samples. Um, we've started aerial larva siding in the Western Placer and agri agricultural areas, and that happens weekly on Mondays and Tuesdays and then Thursdays and Fridays. And the public can sign up for treatment updates on our website, placermosquito.org, and they can get those notifications emailed to them weekly of where we're treating. Um, again, those aerial larvicide treatments are pretty much all in the rice field areas of Western Placer right now. We are encouraging the public to submit dead bird reports to the state, westnile.ca.gov, because dead birds are that first idea for our district where West Nile virus might be. So how can the public protect themselves from West Nile virus? We're encouraging people to use EPA registered repellents. Those are repellents that include ingredients like DEET, picaridin, IR3535, or oil of lemon eucalyptus. Get rid of all that standing water. That's where mosquitoes breed. You want to get rid of any standing water on your property. Look for old tires, kiddie pools, anything that can collect it. And then again, if you're seeing something unusual, you have a question, you have a concern, give us a call or visit our website, placermosquito.org, and we're, we'd be happy to answer questions. The other news at our district is that we have detected invasive Aedes mosquitoes again. These mosquitoes have been spreading throughout California since 2013. They have the ability to transmit deadly diseases like Zika, Dengue, Chikungunya, and Yellow Fever, although we don't have those diseases circulating here in Placer County right now. Um, we found Aedes aegypti in the county in 2019. And in 2020 and 2021, we did not see them again, which we can assume they were also sheltering in place. And then come 2022, we actually did detect them again in the Roseville neighborhood and Granite Bay neighborhoods. So in August of last year, they had kind of spread in the Roseville neighborhoods of Crest Haven, Cherry Glen, Fields Manor, and Hillcrest. They're kind of all right next to each other. Um, and then, you know, once we get into September and October, when those cooler nights come, they, they tend to go away. Now, this year, it's very early for us to be finding them. So just a few weeks ago, we did find a female adult Aedes aegypti mosquito in the Cherry Glen neighborhood. So we are responding with our invasive Aedes response plan, which includes enhanced surveillance, looking to see if we can find different life cycles of the Aedes aegypti mosquito. And then based on what we find, we make treatment decisions or control methods that we put in place. So again, with invasive 80s, it's really important to protect yourself almost identically with West Nile virus. You want to use EPA registered repellents and get rid of all standing water. Invasive 80s need little amounts of water to breed. I mean, we're talking a cap full of water or even the water that collects in your sprinkler head. That can breed these mosquitoes. Um, so again, they, they are hard to find and they're hard to control, so we're asking for the public's help with those mosquitoes by getting rid of all standing water. That's all I have for you today, just a quick annual update, um, and I'm open to answering any questions you may have. Supervisor Gore has a question. Okay. Yes, thank you, Megan. Yes. Thank you for the presentation, and thank you for your partnership. I really appreciate you working uh, with me and my team as we're promoting awareness about how to prevent mosquito bites and um, address concerns about mosquitoes, so thank you. Yes. Um, one question for you about um, just outreach and it comes to the Cherry Glen area. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've connected with the Neighborhood Association there um, in Roseville, but if mm -hmm. you need to, we're happy to connect you because I think that's okay. really important to get to the neighborhoods where they can share that information as well. Yes, I will reach out to you after the meeting and make sure I have their contact information. Terrific, I'll ask yeah. my chief of staff to reach out to you. Maybe. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Supervisor Landon. 
Thank you, Megan. You always do such a great job and really concise presentations and always really great information. So thank you. Thank I just you. have a quick question on ponds. Um, if someone has a pond and they are interested in mosquito fish, what are the what are the requirements that you look for for whether they're eligible for that or not? So other species that might be in the pond is really important to our technicians. They come out and they make sure that it's a good source so, so that the mosquito fish are going to be able to survive overnight. So a lot of times we get a lot of calls like in February and March for mosquito fish. We're like, call back when it's a little bit warmer at night because if it's cold at night, those mosquito fish might die off. But again, they're really looking for other species if there is larvae in the water. Um, so the mosquito fish have a job to do. And then um, mosquito fish are a controlled species. Um, they are a predator. So again, other species in the pond is really important. For the most part, they're very successful in ponds in Placer County. And we hear a lot of good things from people in the public who have mosquito fish. Great, thank you. Yeah. Welcome. Supervisor Jones. Good morning. Good morning. Um, thank you. I have a couple of questions. Um, the first I wanna ask about the, the rainfall. I just learned over the weekend that it's against the law in California to retain rainfall. And so it seemed kind of strange, particularly for farmers down Central Valley. But I'm wondering, is this part of, do you have any idea if this is part of why it's been outlawed? I don't have that answer. I can, I can look into it. I mean, I know with um, rain barrels that have been used in the past, we've always discouraged them because sometimes on the top of the barrel, water would collect, which would end up being a breeding source, and we'd find mosquito larvae in there. Right. Um, I could definitely look into that and get back yeah. to you, but we've always discouraged rain barrels. Kind of makes sense, you know. Yeah. So. So I'm wondering, besides um, the mosquito fish, they do sell a product, their rings like this, uh, for mosquitoes in ponds. Does that stuff work? Mosquito dunks usually uses a substance, BTI. It's a biological substance that does work really well. We don't encourage any sort of specific brand, or right, we really ask right. people to have us come out and make sure we know what's going on in their pond before they do anything. But yeah, we've, we've heard mosquito dunks work really well. Okay, because um, I don't know how, do the mosquito fish survive year after year or are they just seasonal? Some do. Um, sometimes we get calls back where they, their entire pond is full of mosquito fish because they've breeded themselves in the pond. And, and we actually have a few public ponds that help us breed mosquito fish um, for our services to other members of the public. So yeah, they sometimes survive, sometimes they don't. So people will call in, like I said, every year and ask for more mosquito fish. Right, right. Yeah, and it's really easy to submit a report on our website. If you go to plastermosquito.org, a button pops up, it says report a problem. You'll click that button, scroll down to the standing water section, click that you want mosquito fish, add in all your information, and our technicians are in touch as soon as they can be to come out and do an inspection. Okay, okay, wonderful. Um, so about the DEET, uh, is, that, is that the best thing and it will prevent mosquitoes from biting you? Yeah, so there's been studies done on, you know, the best types of mosquito and safest types of mosquito repellent to use, and those, the, the repellents that I mentioned, repellents that include DEET or picaridin, have been approved by the EPA. So that's what we really recommend. That's what works. Um, you can go and look on YouTube or anywhere and they have videos of someone, you know, putting their hand in a mosquito, a box full of mosquitoes oh, okay. to see if the repellent works. And, and those usually do a lot better than some of the other brands or other ingredients that are used. Okay, well you won't see me trying that. <laughs> <good. laughs> Um, one last thing I think is important for people to understand is how dangerous um, West Nile virus is. I had a neighbor several years ago who was walking her dog in our neighborhood in Granite Bay. And she got bit by a mosquito, and I'm not sure she even realized it. But she had um, leukemia. She had an underlying uh, illness. And so one of the symptoms that she had was sort of a delirium of not knowing where she was or what was going on and it was a little bit strange and of course what comes to mind is dehydration you know because we kind of get a little bit loopy like that when we get dehydrated mm -hmm. so i think it's important for people to realize that if you if you're out and about and you're not using deed or something like that and all of a sudden your behavior changes 
check out for the mosquito bites and get treated right away. Um, my poor neighbor, because of her illness, you know, three weeks and she was gone. Wow. Three weeks. I'm so sorry. So, um, so it's, it's pretty shocking, but let you all know, please be aware it's summertime and mosquitoes are out there. Right. Thank you so much for your yeah. report and Thank all your you. information. You're, you're quite smart. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Megan. I, I do have a comment. Uh, last week I was down in Mountain View at the Google campus. And uh, the Googler, that's what they call people that uh, work at Google, you know that, <laughs> told, us, told us that they had had an infestation of mosquitoes, uh, quite, a, quite a big infestation. And they're very uh, concerned. They are trying to uh, preserve their uh, natural uh, environment around the campus. But what they did, because I was looking up in the eaves and I saw a bird's nest. And it was swallows. They brought swallows in to uh, manage the mosquito population. So that's just a little tidbit that I learned uh, on my travels. So yeah, thank you. That's for, interesting. Thank you. Thank you for your report. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, since there's no more board board member comments, is there anyone uh, in the audience that wishes to address the board on this item? I see none. Is there anyone online? No, no Chairman. Alrighty. Thank you for, there's thank no action you. taken. This is a thank you for your presentation. We appreciate it. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now we'll move to our uh, item 7A, uh, department item, health and human service contra contracts resolutions. Vicki Grenier. Hello, Vicki. Hello. Thank you, Chair Holmes. Good morning, board members. My name is Vicki Grenier, Deputy Director of HHS Administrative Services. I'm here today to request the board to adopt two resolutions. The first item is to request the approval to adopt a resolution authorizing the Director of Health and Human Services to submit applications, execute revenue contracts, and execute non-monetary cooperative agreements, all pursuant to the terms contained in the resolution, also called the HHS Revenue and Cooperative Agreement Resolution. Your board originally adopted a similar resolution in 2015 and this resolution is needed to align with the updated increased threshold of 500,000 from the previous amount of 400,000 and to include business associate agreements as related to HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. The second item is to request the approval to adopt a resolution authorizing the Director of Health and Human Services or designee to execute 45 identified agreements for various HHS divisions and services pursuant to the terms contained in the resolution, also known as the HHS Annual Contract Resolution, in the amount not to exceed $9,400,777. HHS administers over 700 contractual agreements, most requiring Board of Supervisor approval. These services include vital and often mandated services such as inpatient psychiatric services, prevention and early intervention, and family resource services. As a significant efficiency improvement, over 20 years ago, your Board of Supervisors adopted a single resolution process for expenditure agreements. Criteria for this cycle includes agreements which were originally approved as a standalone item by the Board of Supervisors, recurring agreements with annual contract amounts of less than 500,000 each, and agreements to be executed with the effective beginning dates during fiscal year 23-24, with a term no longer than two years. Execution is subject to express concurrence of county council and risk management. The attached agreement identifies all 45 items listed at the current contracted amount. The requested amount includes up to a 10% increase to allow for possible changes within the existing scope of services, plus a 10% maximum for amendment authority. The services for fiscal year 23-24 already included in the fiscal year 23-24 budget that was brought to your board earlier this month and that will also be presented today in item 4A. In addition to thanking everyone who makes HHS contracts possible, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the contracts team and their staff services manager, Nancy Baggett, for their diligence with HHS contracts and their valuable services provided to HHS throughout the last year. I would also like to thank Sarah Poindexter, Renju Jacob, Risk Management, IT, and Procurement for their continued efforts working with HHS on all agreements, along with the contributions of the community partners. I appreciate your consideration adopting both resolutions. 
requested for these critical HHS services. I can answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions from board members? I see none. Uh, is there anyone in the audience has a, who wants to address this item? See none. Is there anyone online? I see none, Chairman. Alrighty. So can we take this as one action? Yes. Yeah. Alrighty. Uh, the chair will entertain a motion. I'll move approval. I'll second. The motion has been uh, moved by Supervisor Jones, second by Supervisor Gore. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. The item is moved. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you so much. Now we'll now move to item 7B, County Revenue Cycle Management and State Reporting Services Agreement with California Mental Health Services Authority, Ms. Amy Ellis. Hello. Good morning, uh, Chair Holmes and members of the board. Amy Ellis here with, from, the, uh, from the Director of the Adult System of Care. Um, I have an action item today to approve an agreement with California Mental Health Services Authority to participate in their county revenue cycle management and state reporting services in an amount not to exceed $1,081,000 for the period of July 1, 2023 through March 20th, 2029 and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the agreement with risk management and county council concurrence and subsequent to fulfilling any meet and confer obligations and to sign subsequent amendments up to $100,000 consistent with the agreement subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. So uh, California Mental Health Services Authority, also known as CalMESA, is a joint powers of authority formed by all of the counties throughout California. We work um, as CalMESA works collaboratively on multi-county projects. They've been working with the Department of Healthcare Services to help counties implement the statewide initiatives under California Advancing and Innovating Medi-Cal, otherwise known as CalAIM. So CalMESA is ran by a former behavioral health director and it's staffed by experts across the field. They have been offering technical support and services to counties as they help us implement the many changes happening to behavioral health right now. One of the services that CalMESA is offering is revenue cycle management and state reporting. By contracting for this service, Placer will add the expertise of the CalMESA team to Placer County in order to meet the ambitious CalAIM timelines from the state and allow us to leverage a standardized methodology and create efficiencies from multiple counties who are also participating. The approach allows us to efficiently meet the state man mandates, leverage that expertise, and maximize our staffing resources in a time when workforce is challenged. The total cost of this agreement is $1,081,000. Funding for the, this, the annual amount of $188,000 is available in our fiscal year 23-24 budget, and there will be no additional um, county general fund. And I'm happy to an answer any questions on this one. Thank you, Amy. Any uh, questions from board members? I see none. Is there anyone in the audience wish to address us on this item? See none. Is there anyone online? There is, Chairman. Alexa, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. No other comments? Alrighty. I'll bring it back to the board for action. I'll second. All right. Uh, motion by Supervisor Jones, second by Supervisor Landon. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The item has moved. Thank you. Now we'll move to item 7C Substance Use Treatment Services Agreement with Bi Valley Medical Clinic, Inc. Hi, Amy Ellis here again today with you, to your board to request an action item to approve an agreement with Bi Valley Medical Clinic Incorporated for substance use treatment services in an amount not to exceed $1,365,688 
from July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2025, and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the agreement and sign subsequent amendments up to $100,000, consistent with each agreement's subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. So Placer County's contract with um, DHCS stipulates that Placer County must maintain appropriate access to necessary substance use treatment services, including narcotic treatment programs that provide um, methadone, buphenorphine, disulfram, and naloxone. Um, Placer County has one nar narcotic treatment pro provider located within our geographical boundaries. Um, the majority of our residents are being served through that provider. However, we do have some who work in Sacramento and, in, and to, in order to make access, their services accessible, this particular contract allows them to access this daily medication services at a place that's convenient to them. Um, the contract has been budgeted appropriately with no additional impact to general funds, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions, comments from board members? I see none. Uh, is there anyone in the audience who should address this board on this item? Seeing none, is there anyone online? I see none, Chairman. All righty. Uh, the Chair will entertain a motion. Uh, I'll second. <laughs> uh, the motion has been moved by Supervisor Gore, <laughs> and seconded by Supervisor Jones. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 I think we can squeeze one more in there for you. Oh, great. Uh, we'll go to 7D, Tahoe per Permanent Supportive Housing Agreement. Okay, Amy Ellis again, here to ask your board to approve an agreement with Advocates for Mentally Ill Housing Incorporated for Tahoe Permanent Supportive Housing in an amount not to exceed 981,000 for the period of July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2025, and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the contract and sign any subsequent amendments not to exceed $98,100, consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. On September 22nd, um, 2020, your board authorized Health and Human Services to apply for the, the round one home key funding in which um, we were able to be successful and acquire a, pro a property in Kings Beach. Um, in October, uh, let, let's see, then we began renovations on that particular property. This particular contract will allow us to complete that rehabilitation by the end of this, um, by this, this, this uh, calendar year and be able to add 13 additional units of permanent supportive housing to the King Beach, North Lake Tahoe, Placer County region. The total cost of this agreement is $981,000. It will include both finishing those renovations and the services and supports to fully lease up that property. And the funding um, in the amount of $700,500 is available in this 23-24 budget and the remaining $280,500 dollars will be included in 24-25 budget. There's no additional impact to general fund with this particular contract and happy to answer any questions. Alrighty, any questions, comments from board members? I see none. Is there anyone in the audience wish to address this item? I'm seeing none. Do we have anyone online? I see none, Chairman. Alrighty, I'll bring it back for action. I'll move approval. I'll second. So moved by Supervisor Jones, second by Supervisor Gore. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none. Let's do one more, okay? Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, Amy Ellis, again, with, uh, here to approve an agreement with Compassion Pathway Behavioral Health LLC to provide adult residential treatment services and medication support services for mentally disabled adults for the period of July 1, 2023 through June 30th, 2025, in a total amount not to exceed 998000 and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to execute the agreement with risk management and county council concurrence and to sign amendments not to exceed $99,800 consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. So Compassion Pathway Behavioral Health, LLC, uh, referred to as Kirby Ranch, is a new, new-ish, uh, six-bed adult residential facility to Placer County. It opened in April of 2022 in Roseville, California. The facility is a sister facility to Compassion Value, Va uh, Valley, with whom we prior um, had contracted and had success with. Um, so this particular contract, it, uh, this contractor, the facility is only five minutes away. It allows us to better coordinate our services between ASOC and what they provide um, in this residential treatment environment. 
and it's, it's been successful. They are also, uh, because of their design, they're able to draw down some Medi-Cal billing, which also helps it be cost effective. So the total cost of this agreement is 998,000, which has been budgeted across two years, and there's no additional impact to general fund with this contract to continue, and happy to answer any questions. Supervisor Landon. Leftover, sorry. Oh, leftover. <laughs> Supervisor Jones. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Hi, Amy, how Hi. are you today? Um, so it says that this is another six bed facility that's gonna be very similar to Kirby Ranch. So it's, it's already open. We've okay. been using it. This is a continuance okay. of the contract. So it's not new to open. It's been okay. open since uh, April of 2022, oh, okay. so about a year. Okay. And at Kirby Ranch, do they keep all the beds filled to the, for the most part? Yeah, oh, for sure. This is a level of treatment that is in high demand. Um, we could probably open 20 more and fill them, honestly. So uh -huh. um, it's, we're very blessed and lucky that they expanded. A six, another six bed facility here in Roseville. Okay, and can you explain for the general public um, s sort of like what patients that you serve? I mean, with the mental health yeah. issues, it's not disabled people with. Um, no, yeah, correct. I call it educational or, or whatever, disabilities, the ones who can't dress themselves or ones who right. can't brush their teeth. Yeah, so their staff includes um, a psychiatrist. Um, therapist, licensed therapist, group therapy, um, so and a lot of other services like kind of geared around self-sufficiency. So mm -hmm. there is that similarity mm -hmm. um, related to being able to dress and hygiene and all of those things. I think those would be similar at, at, at those kinds of services. The main difference with this facility is that psychiatric therapy, group counseling, individual therapy component mm -hmm. that is really targeted just to individuals who have severe um, mental health diagnoses. Okay, and you have a good uh, success rate. Yeah, this Miami. facility actually has a very good success rate. Um, they average about 18 months in their facility, and a majority of, there's one, one individual we've placed with them that had to go up, up mm -hmm. to an even higher level of care, but every other individual we've placed there was able to actually m move to a lower level of care and, and achieve even higher uh, independency and self-sufficiency. Do we eventually get to see self-sufficiency? Hoping. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that we definitely get those positive success stories of individuals who who move into to more self sufficient spaces, are able to like live in an apartment on their own with minimal case management instead of having to be twenty four seven um, surrounded with supports. Great. So thanks yeah. to the good work of these people. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Amy. Appreciate it. Uh huh. Thank you. Uh, any other comments from board members? I, I just have a comment um, for the public. Um, this is the end of our fiscal year, and all these contracts generally have providers already in place, but they have to be approved before the end of the fiscal year, and all of the contracts will start on July 1st. Yes, yes, and I'll be back with more after. I know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is there any public comment on this item? I see none. Anyone online? I see none, Chairman. All righty, then I will entertain a motion. I will move approval. It's been moved by Supervisor Jones, second by Supervisor Gore. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none. Thank you. We will see you uh, shortly. Okay. We hope. <laughs> Don't go away. All righty. Now we'll hit move to our thank you for everybody for waiting for us to try to get some business done. Um, we'll move to our 10 o'clock timed item. This is the Auburn Seabird Senior Center presentation. Uh, presentation to the board uh, by Lindsay Arfson. Is that correct? That's correct. Good morning, everyone. I'm Lindsay Arfston, the executive director of the Auburn Senior Center. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. In my presentation, I will be demonstrating why the Auburn Senior Center is essential for Placer County. But first, let's start with the current state of America's aging population. You may not know, but we have a nationwide epidemic of loneliness and isolation following the COVID-19 pandemic. Our seniors are the most affected by this after having been forced to stay home and isolate from family and friends. 
They lost important socialization, comfort, and services. Many are still stuck at home alone with less services available and a loss of confidence to be out in their communities. What health effects are caused by loneliness and depression? Well, the US G Surgeon General states that seniors have an increased risk of high blood pressure, increased risk of heart disease and obesity, increased risk of anxiety and depression, of increased risk of cognitive decline and suicide, and also increased risk of Alzheimer's disease and even death, all from just loneliness and isolation. In addition to these long-term effects of loneliness and isolation, what other national challenges does our older population face? Our nation's senior citizens are the fastest growing homeless population. Seniors on the street right here in Sacramento posted data stating that the effects of post-COVID isolation and poor physical health makes it difficult to maintain residential stability. We have a homelessness crisis. Look at these statistics. From 2017 to 2021, California seniors population increased 7%. People 55 and over who sought homelessness services increased 84%, more than any other age group. So now let's move to our community and I'll show you how the Auburn Senior Center is battling the nation's epidemics. The Auburn Senior Center provides a place for seniors to thrive. We've been open for 43 years, have 21 classes a week, and we serve more than 700 members. We even have free services for our seniors like free taxes, free legal services, and even help with energy bill analysis. We support seniors from all over, not just Auburn. Our residents, our seniors come from Forest Hill, from Colfax, Newcastle, Penryn, Meta Vista, Rockland, and even Weimar. Besides all the statistics, how does the Auburn Senior Center really impact the community? Our overall program provides post-pandemic seniors in Placer County a gathering place for social connection and community we combat isolation with our psychosocial health and wellness programs. Remember the surgeon's ge Surgeon General's list of risks as a result of loneliness and isolation? These classes shown here lower blood pressure, anxiety, and depression. All of the classes on this slide also work to improve cognitive function, give seniors a purpose, something to look forward to, reduce anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, and lower blood pressure. These are, we have our baking class, our writing class, chair yoga for seniors, our knitting group, our cooking classes, ukulele, voice lessons, our wood carving club, and even painting rocks. Another deadly effect of isolation and loneliness is heart disease and obesity. These exercise classes help our seniors stay active, have stronger bones and muscles, and help keep them from falling so they can stay independent longer. They are making new friends and feeling included in addition to benefiting their heart health. In fact, these four classes are our most popular, well-attending classes each week. We have aerobics, we have balance, strength, and stability, line dancing, and our senior strength training class. The Surgeon General states that isolation and loneliness contributes to cognitive decline in Alzheimer's. These games, family research, and learning language all offer opportunities for cognitive improvement along with socialization and purpose. We have penny bingo, mahjong, cribbage, conversational Spanish, chess club, spaghetti bingo, pea knuckle, and genealogy. I've shown you how the Auburn Senior Center is battling against the nation's epidemic. Now let's ask, what steps has Placer County taken to support its seniors? Well, I'm happy to say that Placer County has, is working with the Agency on Aging and HHS to proactively plan for the growing population of seniors in Placer County. These are the three documents I'll be quoting. 
We have the Placer County Plan for Aging Needs Assessment. We have a five-year plan for meeting the needs of a growing senior population in Placer County. And we have the County of Placer Mental Health Services Act. In the Placer County Master Plan for Aging Need Assessment, goal number three is inclusion, not isolation. It says Placer County needs Placer County needs ideas and systems, structures and processes that promote a sense of belonging, connection and community where all people feel known, welcomed and valued. Well, that's exactly what the Senior Center offers. We serve seniors so they feel known and valued. This helps seniors, this helps prevent the diseases and mental problems associated with isolation and loneliness. In the County of Placer Mental Health Service Acts, it states, many, many service providers welcome older adults by default. However, there appears to be no programs targeted to this population. Unfortunately, there are limited agencies in Placer County serving older adults. Looking at last year's data tells us that the 60 plus population constitutes only 9.3% of all services provided. Yet, the 60 plus population is 42% of all Placer's registered voters. The programs and services offered at the Auburn Senior Center are essential to the mental health of Placer seniors. Our social support and resources help stabilize seniors to keep them <coughs> self-sufficient and out of homeless shelters. The purpose of the five-year plan for meeting the needs of a growing senior population in Placer County is to make Placer County a more livable and age-friendly community for older adults. With the surge of California's aging population, community-based supports and health services play a role in enabling older adults to remain safely in their homes and delay or prevent institutionalization. The Auburn Senior Center is a community-based support. Part of the Auburn Senior Center's mission is to help seniors stay safely in their home. We support a community of more than 700 members. Our classes, workshops, and support groups support the physical, mental, emotional, and economic well-being of seniors. Our prices are very affordable for seniors. Our yearly membership is only $25 for a whole year. Our drop-in fees are either five or seven dollars for our classes, and we keep it affordable for seniors so even those on a fixed income can come. We are a 501c3 organization, and because of that need for funds, I, lately, in the last few months, I've been speaking in community groups asking for financial support. Now, let's take a look at the other senior centers in Placer County and see how they are supported. We have the Maidu Center, the Maidu Senior Community Center is supported by the city of Roseville. And the Senior Center is just part of the overall community center. Then we have the Loomis Senior Life Center and that's supported by the Methodist Church of Loomis. It's only open Tuesdays and Thursdays from eight to one, so it's pretty small compared to the Auburn Senior Center. And just recently the Lincoln Senior Center opened and it's supported by the city of Lincoln and the Lincoln Hills Foundation. The Auburn Senior Center currently is not supported by any government entities, churches, or foundations. Just a few months ago, Placer County joined AARP's network of age-friendly states and communities. The AARP article states that Placer County's senior population will increase 26,000 by 2030, which is really not that far away. And this is becoming part of a nation's network reflects the county's commitment to creating a more livable, age-friendly community for older adults. So it's clear to see that the Auburn Senior Center is essential to Placer County's commitment to be an age-friendly community and to implement the county's advised goals for its senior population. Can I get a show of hands if you agree? Ow. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Um. Well, well 
plate. Do, do you have any questions? Any questions, comments from board members at this time? I see none. Uh, okay. So I'll open it up to uh, any of the public that wishes to uh, comment to the board. I guess, oops. I guess I'll go first. Yeah. Um, I'm Rosie Wolfram. I live in the city of Auburn. Back in April, I wrote a letter to the Auburn Journal outlining the history of our senior center. I spoke of our original site at the DeWitt Center, where we were only paying $1 a year in rent. Years later, the building was considered unsafe, and we were told to move. The only place we could find was in an office building downtown. This downtown location was tough for some of our seniors to navigate. And consequently, we lost a lot of members. At the time, this building space was costing us $6,000 a month. We used the money that Costco gave us when Costco's application was denied. That's another story. I won't go into that. <laughs> Currently, we are, occupying a sp we are occupying a space which is costing us $4,000 a month. This is unsustainable. No amount of memberships will fund this expenditure. Our senior center provides a crucial benefit to every senior in our area. According to the CDC, being involved and learning new skills equates to seniors' health and well-being. What we need is either a benevolent landlord or a space provided by the county once again. And we need it now. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Rosie. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer, Placer County. Um, this is actually like very important. Um, I took care of my grandparents until they passed for several years. Um, and many seniors are on a very fixed income. Um, this whole issue with dementia and not being able, becoming too ill to care for yourself, it leads you in two positions. One, to live with your family, if that's possible. Two, to go into a care home. Or I think three, you end up in a Medi-Cal facility, or I guess now four, homeless. And so by having community places for elder people to go where they can get resources and get help may prevent that. The institutions that people pay privately to go to, you can have supplemental health insurance, um, like in the way of a long-term health care plan to help, but uh, dementia units 10 years ago were $10,000 a month, and if you are not very wealthy or you're planning to live a long time because you are healthy, you end up being punished or you have nowhere to live. So uh, I think this is a, a very important thing to consider because we're all going to be aging and we do need to support one another and create a community where people can go and get help with bills to reduce bills because it's very hard to navigate all these types of things and two meetings back we had that issue with the sewer line where people's property taxes are less than their actual sewer bill and so we are really doing a disservice to our aging population on a fixed income, lucky enough to have retirement. Many of us as we age won't have retirement. Those benefits and such will be taken away. So I really hope you consider helping them and helping other programs come in to help assist with bills to get reductions because every penny counts. And this generation has a lot of knowledge and they should be allowed to live freely and have a very good quality of life and share that knowledge with the rest of us. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Sherry Cousins, and I would like to take just a couple of minutes, and I really mean just a couple of minutes, to talk to you about the subject of relevancy. When you stop and think about it, <clears throat> relevancy when we're young in our middle years is all about defining what it means to be relevant, basically developing ways to be relevant. But when we become seniors, 
we are concerned about staying relevant. And that's where the wonderful resource of our senior center comes in. For the past year, I have been volunteering there, teaching a series of cooking classes, basically called Almost Healthy Eating. And <laughs> in the interest of full disclosure, I haven't attended any of their classes, but I'm nosy. So I have peeked in to a variety of classes. And I am amazed at the, the AARP mecca of energy and activity that goes on in, in this place. Um, Lindsay talked a lot about all of the programs, the social, the health, and whatever. I would like just to touch on an area that wasn't covered very much <clears throat> because I'm talking about relevancy. And when you're talking about relevancy, you have to consider technology. And mainly, that would be uh, computers and these things. Um, it is no secret that those of us of a certain age often have trouble with technology, particularly the ever-changing nature of it. And I'm going to bet all of you have, either on you or very close to you, one of these. And the reason that you have one of these is because you cannot make a reservation, an appointment, uh, buy something, uh, return it or complain about it, well, the list is fairly endless, without using either this or the computer. And it becomes very, very difficult if you don't have a knowledge of how to do that. I'd like to leave you, I did promise you a couple of minutes, I will keep to that, with a vivid description of how this can work. There is a senior couple on a very fixed income, basic knowledge of computer, and up until a year ago, the only thing they had was a flip phone for a cell phone. And you remember those? Mm -hmm. So last year, they upgraded to a smartphone. They could only afford one. And they took the classes having to do with, basically, A to Z, how to use a smartphone. And the thing they zeroed in on was how to download and navigate apps. You're okay. Okay. And um, I'm coming. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, they did that. And they downloaded all the grocery store apps in the area. And um, because now grocery stores are going to digital coupons. And they want you to download their apps so there are good deals to be found on these digital coupons. So this couple last week went into our local Safeway and they only shop every two weeks, their bill was $278. But they walked out of that store saving $71 of that. And that's huge. So I'm asking you to show the seniors of Auburn and the surrounding community that we matter. Keep our senior center open. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, again. Good morning again, Harriet. Former Supervisor Harriet White of North Auburn. And also, I am the American Mahjong facilitator for the Senior Center. <laughs> I'm going to read what I have to say because I don't want to miss any points. <laughs> when I took office in 1997, the Senior Center had been open 17 years. Former Supervisor Terry Cook had helped add the Beecher's Room to the then county facility, which increased programs and activities. You are already aware older adults require a safe environment in which to feel connected and engage in meaningful activities to promote well-being and improve brain function. Recent census data show unincorporated Placer County has almost 30% residents over the age of 60, and this number is estimated to triple by 2040. Unincorporated Auburn itself has 14,000 people, residents. If you take 30% of that, 
boy, the senior center would really be servicing a lot of people if they w had the facility and the funds to do so. Um, as an aside, the number of homeless in Placer County is quite a bit fewer compared to the senior center who are in need of services. There is an important need for a Placer County Senior Center to serve the psychological, emotional, and educational well-being of this growing portion of our Placer County population. The Auburn Senior Center provides for much of the needs of seniors in the unincorporated area from Loomis to Weimar, but more needs to be done, and we're trying. Hopefully, with your help directing the Department of Health and Human Services, even more can be done for this sensitive Placer County population. Thank you. Thank you, Harriet. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I know um, Susan, Jim, Cindy. I haven't met Bonnie, I guess, Karen, or the new supervisors. Um, I was president, vice president, secretary, treasurer of the senior center. I worked my way up from the senior center. <laughs> 20 years in the senior center. Senior center is my passion. And I'm still here to talk to you guys. Thank you very much for getting the senior center on the agenda. A couple of years ago, we tried that. Uh, we got an audience of the supervisors, which we appreciate instead of getting on the agenda. The senior center still needs help. Um, I checked the budget from the supervisors, Plastic County. I don't see anything in there for the senior center. We would greatly appreciate getting on the budget for the next year, if possible. And that would help the senior center. I'm sure the 22-23 budget is already done, but uh, perhaps we can squeeze something in for the senior center. Do you agree? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Jim and I talk about this quite a bit. Cindy also, Cindy's not here today. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention and thank you for allowing us to come and talk. We need your name for the record, please. Uh, name is Joe Rodriguez, so Joseph Rodriguez. All right. All right. Do that. It's going to have to get in there. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Chairman and Board. I'd like to say that my name is Linda Bowman. I'm a proud 75 year old senior. Yeah. I live by myself with my cat in Weimar, California. I have an acre and a half that I managed by myself since my husband died in the year 2001. Since COVID and being isolated, my plan for aging is to stay in my home. I'm a low income senior and thankfully having retired from Placer County with the Children's Systemal Care, I have a small pension to go along with that and that's what's keeping me afloat. I have had to use the food banks due to increase in my house insurance and PG&E bills. And the Senior Center has really helped me um, to develop a plan to stay in my home safely because I can't afford to go to these <coughs> other facilities. When I started at the Senior Center last year, I wasn't able to really walk very straight and taking those classes, I'm now able to stand up straight I have a whole lot of new friends. If I have a bad day, I can go to the senior center and it brightens my day. It would be devastating to lose this center. I don't have notes here because I'm speaking from my heart and I hope that you will listen to us. We need your funding and support. We've tried to make it on our loan, but it's been difficult, but we're not giving up. The seniors that I go with, the senior center, were active and vital. And we're still a part of your community. We are the ones who built this community. We're asking for your help. When there are tough times, it's the seniors that volunteer and help the community. Help us to stay strong in our physical and mental needs. 
so that we can help you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Eleanor Pateski. I live in Newcastle, and I kind of want to go back a few years. When I first came up uh, to this area, there was a thriving senior center. There were activities. I remember walking into it. There were people practicing barbershop quartet. There were people playing games. There were people socializing. Across the street, there were buildings where they had ceramic classes, painting classes, exercise classes. You had a gym, you had a Olympic-sized pool, you had a theater, all in that area. It was a huge community center. It's all gone now, except for the theater. And it was a vibrant community. And moving into a small office area isn't the same. And particularly when you have to pay a high level of rent. Seniors in this community, I'm 83. Seniors in this community have been paying taxes. They've been voting for you. They have been volunteering all over the place for all kinds of programs, whether it's dealing with children, whether it's dealing with who knows what. They have been a vital part of the community. And they have not been included in your help. And so it is now time for Placer County supervisors to step up to the plate and provide some financing for the Senior Center. It doesn't just serve Auburn, it serves a huge area. And as I saw with the presentation, Roseville has help, Lincoln has help. There are various areas that have help. This area doesn't have any. So I'm encouraging you to support the Senior Center. The other thing I would like to suggest, we're standing here in the domes. I read in the Auburn Journal the other day, the domes are going to be vacated. You guys are going to be moving to the main area over there on DeWitt. This is a good place for a senior center. Yeah. It really is. You've got the library. You've got the park. You have parking. You have transportation access. This is your community center. Seniors, whatever else. But I think you should consider this. It's a really, really, really good location. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Charlene Daniels, and I want to talk about the importance of the Senior Center using my dad as an example. In 1968, he was recognized as one of the top scientists in the country. In 2003, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. He came up to Auburn so I could help look at after him, and he moved in a facility across from DeWitt. He joined the Senior Center. He took bridge. He made friends. He could walk to the Senior Center. That helped keep him independent, and it really helped his self-esteem. There's a lot of stories like that. Again, the Senior Center does a lot to help seniors and keep them vibrant. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Al Lombardo. I know some of you people. James, Jane, hello. Uh, I moved up here from the Bay Area seven years ago, from Pleasanton, if you ever heard of it. And I worked and helped out and supported the Senior Center in Pleasanton. It was vibrant. The city supported it, the county supported it. There was all kinds of activities. They had a fresh building. It was a pleasure to go in there. They had gym classes, exercise classes, Tai Chi. They had everything. They even had a nice facility for dining. Come up here, and I said, oh, wow, we have a singer center. I go over to the singer center. Mm. Yeah, I said, what's going on? And it was almost like they were a stepchild. You know, they were struggling, and, but they still had the spirit behind them providing all these classes, reaching out to try and raise, keep themselves afloat. However, so my thought is uh, you can't make them a stepchild. Now, I'm not putting it all on the county. It's got to be a, 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 joint, a joint effort with the city of Auburn or maybe by the county itself if they can't do it. 
and I had mentioned to Cindy, was just a brain thought, is why don't you have a line item budget for all the senior centers? We provide it for the animal shelter, we provide that, which we're doing a great job there. We're providing for the homeless people, which we're doing a great job there. But we got our community here, the senior center, seniors, that we should have a line item budget where people with the, um, uh, each facility would come up there and try and justify a, a, a need. And you guys could audit it and you guys could make sure that it's being spent properly. But they have that type of a cushion for all the senior centers, not just that, uh, for our senior center, but all of them and they would be able to, to prosper and grow. Thank you. Thanks, Al. Good morning, Margo. Good morning. You? Greetings from South Placer, yeah, everyone. Uh, I am uh, Muriel Moore. I'm from the Roseville area, well, from Roseville, uh, and I'm coming up here to speak in terms of the Senior Center for Auburn, because I'm a member of the Older Adult Commission for Placer County, of which Lindsay and quite a few others have served on, including some uh, supervisors. So just want to say that in support of that, it seems that regardless of whether it's the county or the city or the state, we take out, when you're doing budgets, you take out the human element of what's needed and necessary for its citizenry, citizens of whether it's the state, the city, or the county. And that's a no-no because it is the human element that made it possible for things to thrive within the state, city, or county. The Senior Center for Auburn is necessary because it is our dollars, senior dollars, that made this city county, state, possible to be thriving in an era of so, so much devastation and destruction going on elsewhere. So it is, in, it is necessary that we keep it going for the sure pleasure of the retirement and adult and, and getting out of the isolation for our older adults so that they can continue on after putting in all of that work over all of these years to make this county a better county and a one that people want to move to, it is necessary that we keep it going. Unlike the South Placer, which has so many uh, senior communities down in there, which provides for those kinds of facilities where they can go and seniors can go in and interact and socialize, we don't have it up here and I say we because I'm county too, we don't have it up here in Auburn, so it's necessary for the human touch and because you hit upon, the county hits upon so many little isolated communities, Weimar and Colfax and so forth. You need a big center where people can come off those hills and come down <laughs> and come down and socialize with their friends and enjoy, enjoy life. Okay, that's all I want to say. Thank you, Muriel. Oh. Hello. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Sheila Steinberg. I live in Meadow Vista. I have been here since um, I was 31 when, when I moved here in 1981. I never gave the senior center a thought. Why would I? And here I am today. Guess what I need? I need the senior center. All these beautiful people behind you need, your, need the Senior Center. I was totally amazed and disappointed to hear, after having recently become involved with the Senior Center, that they have no county funding. I am just so amazed and disappointed that this could be happening when you can, especially when you consider the amount of seniors that live in this county. There are so many people that spoke before, before me that told, told you this story. I will say to you that when I was 31 and moved here, again, 
no thought about the senior center. Now I do. Why? Because now I'm 72 years old. And guess what? I need it. And guess what? Someday you will too. You and your loved ones will need the senior center. And if the county doesn't get involved, you may not have that available to you, nor will your loved ones. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. My name is Pat Pitts. Yes, sometimes it's the Pitts. <laughs> I want to thank you all for taking the time to listen to all of us. We appreciate that. But I'm going to ask seniors, no matter if you're a member or not, can you stand? <laughs> you can you stand real quick? <laughs> <laughs> really quick. <laughs> Could you please take a look at our ages? <laughs> we are so blankety blank. That's right. <laughs> Thank you all. If you look at our ages, we're the ages more than likely, well, of some of you, of your parents. We probably work two jobs to help you go through college, help you sit where you're sitting right now. You got help from them. We need your help. That's what everybody is what we're asking you to do. You know, I was looking up to see what I was going to talk about. And all of a sudden, I came across a couple of months ago, the homeless number was 751, I believe. I think our membership is over 800. I think, yeah. And I was looking up, and I had to sit down for this. Millions of dollars have been spent on this group of 751. Then I looked over here at the senior population. Wow, nothing. <laughs> no tax dollars anywhere to help our center. That's what we're asking for. And then I went on and studied some more and found out, wow, tax dollars even go to the do homeless dogs. Oh boy, you know. I have a big mouth because of the fact that I see the faces that come into the center and then they leave with these huge grins and a free cup of coffee. I'm not asking, I'm begging for some money. <laughs> Plain and simple, we need help and come and visit us. You'll see. Thank you all. Thank you, Pat. Anyone else? Good morning. My name is Vicki Stonebarger. Hi, Vicki. And we've heard a lot about how the Senior Center needs money and different ways that we could support them and fund them. Um, I'm looking at a news article that says um, in your May 23rd meeting, you were notified that uh, most revenues are exceeding budget, in fact, in almost all cases, that there may be as much as a $43 million surplus in this county. Uh, it wouldn't take millions to put the seniors in a safe building that they could thrive in, that they could increase their activities in, that they wouldn't be operating at a deficit to their budget. Thank you. Thank you. A speech I get so damn nervous I can't see straight. <laughs> uh, my name is Charlie Prince. They called me when I was growing up kind of Prince Charles. <laughs> uh, I don't know how these things work. How close do I have to get? Am I good? I was born in Salem, Massachusetts and my wife was not a witch. <laughs> okay. Maybe sometime she had to. <laughs> 
You she probably had, earned it. She had 12 <laughs> kids. Anyway, I want to talk about the senior senator and what it done for me. Just a small example. I'm taking a strength class. I don't feel any stronger yet, but I'm working on it. But this class has normally 20 gals and me. <laughs> I love those odds. <laughs> I, I actually named this class one day as the Macho Gals, because they were tough and they don't give up. And every time I looked around in this class, I was inspired by the, they still did not give up. We have an instructor that donates her time. I tried to offer to pay her gas bill. She lives in Rockland, commutes up here. No way she would. This group of gals and the instructor and just the whole atmosphere has picked me up because I lost my wife three and a half years ago and it just devastated me. I was married 54 and a half years. I was in the dumps until I went into this class and I go every single week that I can. And I just want to say I was shocked to realize that the senior center rented the place we were in. How ridiculous is that? I just don't understand that. Anyway, give us some help. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the audience wish to address the board? Hello, my name is Ann E. Dalgo, and I am the board president of the Auburn Senior Center. And as you can see, we have a lively bunch of <laughs> members that we're trying to wrangle all the time, keeping them <laughs> doing their thing. Um, and I'm so thankful that you guys are just got us on the agenda today, and I'm so grateful that you're listening to all of this. So I just wanted to thank you guys, because I know you all have grandparents. I know you probably know half these people. <laughs> We're a very small town. So thank you so much for listening to everyone today, and thank you for getting us on the agenda. And if you have any creative ideas, there's been so much thrown out. Yeah, sure, we love this building, but we'll take any building. We'll take anything. I mean, I don't want to say we're beggars, but we don't have a lot of options. So any creative ideas, any emails, any think groups, our board's very active. We're constantly talking. Our budget is public. So anything you guys want to do to help us in any level, we'll take love, accept, and be super excited. And they'll sing and joy and dance. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Sure what that is anyway Scott Holbrook North Auburn resident first off I guess none of you were here when they booted these guys out of DeWitt ridiculous kick them five hundred thousand dollars say bye we're gonna put a Costco in here you know just a couple months ago you spent well over a million some on dollars for homeless people that have very little connection to the community in general uh, probably that contract spent at least $500,000 more than you needed to based on what we've seen when it went a little more competitive out there. Obviously, there's funding available. The seniors in our community, which I'm now one too, really, really could use that. I also know that people like the rec district and others are here to partner with them. But, but it's embarrassing that we do not have a facility, a good facility. You go to other communities. They have excellent places for seniors to go. We put more focus and more money on transient homeless than we do our own seniors. So do the right thing. again and I'd just like to add something uh, to the best of my knowledge the homeless situation is a mandated situation for the county as well as the cities so as much as I appreciate what Mr. Holbrook just said uh, it's a different story okay. yeah. 
All right. Is there anyone online that wishes to address the board? I see none, Chairman. All righty. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Landry, you're very patient. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is by far one of my favorite public hearings. I, you have all been super entertaining. <laughs> I just, uh, you all have quite a sense of humor and great stories. So, um, I, from my understanding, we can't take any action on this today because it's not an action item on the agenda, but I just wanted to share a couple of my thoughts um, so you kind of know where I am. Um, this is, uh, this is definitely an area that I am interested in and I am more than happy to have future, a, future, a future conversation about the funding for this. My own grandparents utilized the senior center in Jackson where I grew up and um, I'll share a little tidbit about myself. We had our wedding reception at the senior center because... <laughs> um, because we were just poor college students and that was the cheapest place in town. So, um, but I, I agree so much with, with so much of what many of you said, which is that our senior population is so important to us. They have valuable um, insights and life experience to provide us all with and it's part of our duty to respect them and to provide them with opportunities to socialize and to just have a good quality of life as they age and so um, that's where I am right now I'm open to future conversations and to being creative as you mentioned to try and find some solutions in the future thank you supervisor Landon is there anyone else want to make a comment supervisor Gore thank you I do um, also appreciate you all coming um, making your way up here and sharing your input really do appreciate it you know as I, I think about all of this it really I think comes down to partnerships and where the senior center can partner uh, you know it's not just the county but I'm, I'm sitting here brainstorming I found out that Placer County Office of Education has got new offices in Rockland and might they have some space over here in the library and I'm texting Gail Garbolino and Mojica and asking her questions and so as much as possible, I think about um, opportunities, like I think about boys and girls clubs, and they have kids in the afternoon, but great facilities. Might there be an opportunity to partner there? Might there be an opportunity to partner with the Elks Club or the Veterans Hall? Um, and, and I know that it's not a, the end all, because right now trying to find a bigger space and a more probably a more versatile space than what you have is really important, but I want to encourage um, thoughts about partnerships um, and I, I'm certainly open to us having more conversations about how the county can be supportive but I think in this day and age as much as we can partner with other groups um, to utilize space I think that that's also another really good option but thank you again everyone for making your time to be here this morning thank you, Supervisor. <laughs> Supervisor Jones Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I see familiar faces. Hi, Muriel. Hi. Um, I served, I'm right there with you all. I served on the Older Adult Advisory Commission with Muriel for six years uh, prior to this, and currently now I'm, I'm on the Area 4 Agency on Aging Commission um, as a supervisor. And um, I understand what you're all saying, and I understand the need, and I understand the importance. And as someone said, we, we are all on your heels, maybe some of us sooner than others, but um, you know, we, we understand that. Um, I think that we should have continued um, conversations. We should, and that's very important. I'll tell you a little um, anecdote. My, my little grandfather, he was about five, six, I call him little, um, years and years ago, he was in Florida and he went to their senior center every day and my mom asked him one time, so, you know, do you enjoy the senior center? He says, well, I go because some of the old people need my help. <laughs> and my grandfather was going on 90 at the time. <laughs> so I understand the importance and, and what it does for people. It's just, it's immense, the, the benefits of this kind of thing. So um, I'm there. You want to have a conversation? Let's do it. Always, Michael is on Thank you all for coming. Thank you for your perseverance and, and um, your unity. We don't see many groups like this together, you know. The young people are not joiners, and so um, it's admirable that you all stand for something. Thank you.
Thank you. Many of you may know I was in the auto repair business uh, right on Highway 49, and I had a lot of uh, senior ladies that brought their car to me. And I know they needed uh, for basically three reasons. Well, maybe four. Go to the grocery store, go to the senior center, um, get their hair done. <laughs> But it was so important, and that's another issue we see with our senior population that uh, transportation, uh, we need to be, uh, and we're working, I'm working on the Placer County Transportation Planning Agency in order to uh, find some solutions to provide more transportation options. Uh, we, we fund uh, uh, seniors first for some transportation op opportunities. So that's something that also has to be looked at. Uh, so I appreciate uh, the enthusiasm and the conversation. Uh, and uh, look forward to more continued conversations. Thank you so much for being here. May I approach and give you? What is it? May I approach you and give you what? Yeah, if you don't have. hit me with that thing. <laughs> Remember what Moses did. Uh. This, this is a formal invitation to come on down. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, everybody. The board is going to take a five minute break while the uh, audience uh, retreats.
Uh, we have a 10:30 timed item: parks and open space. Mr. Andy Fisher. Good morning, Andy Fisher with Parks and Open Space. I am here this morning to request a continuance of the public hearing related to the annexation of the Sabre City Park Estates into County Service Area Number 28, Zone of Benefit 11, to a date certain on July 11th, 2023, at 9 a.m. or soon thereafter. Uh, these annexations are governed by uh, state law, very specific uh, noticing and timing requirements. We realized a discrepancy in one of those timing requirements. Uh, we have been in contact with the developer. This continuance would not affect any of the other tasks on their uh, progress. Uh, so we're requesting the continuance to July 11th so we can make sure everything is in order according to Hoyle. All righty, fine. Uh, I need a motion to uh, continue this item. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Supervisor Jones, second by Supervisor Gore. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll move to our 1040 a.m. Time, time, timed item. This is the County Executive Adoptions. Adoption of fiscal year 2023-24 budget, and the chair will entertain a motion. <laughs> just, just check it. Good morning, Chair Holmes, members of the board. I'm Daniel Chatney with the County Executive Office. On my way in here, I was intrigued by the big crowd that we had waiting for the budget presentation, but alas, <laughs> not so much. But I did ask that nice lady if I could borrow that big stick. She said no, so I have a big book instead. So here we go. Yeah. I'm pleased to be here this morning on behalf of the County Departments and the County Executive Office to present to you the fiscal year 23-24 budget for your adoption. Today's goals are to review the budget for 23-24 and related financial information and also take actions for final budget adoption. Today's requested actions are the culmination of a multi-month process including several public meetings to add transparency to our budget process of finalizing with our budget adoption today on June 27th. The fiscal year 23-24 budget reflects the county's efforts to balance increasing operating expenses with long-term fiscal needs such as post-employment obligations and capital and facility needs. This budget is balanced with new year revenue and reserves, and reserves are only budgeted for capital and other one-time costs. Planned residential and commercial growth lead Plaster's future forecasting. We've engaged economic economic planning systems, EPS, to lead a study to help us uh, define growth timelines as they affect our growth in Plaster County as well as county staffing. With no changes made to this budget since the public hearing on June 13th, the budget shows an overall increase of 55.6 million over the current year's adopted budget, which is a 4.6% increase. The operating budget increased 7% or $70 million over fiscal year 22-23's adopted budget. The capital budgets have decreased overall by $14.6 million, which is not unusual as projects adjust year over year. Just again, our, our revenues and sources for this budget, um, other financing sources at $302 million, and intergovernmental revenue is our largest um, category at $403.5 million. Local taxes, including property taxes and sales tax, coming at $317.9 million, or 25% of the proposed budget. On the expenditure side, um, the uses and budget, sorry, excuse me, the total expenditures and uses and budget for, of almost $1.3 billion is expected is expected increases over fiscal year 22-23 in almost all expense categories. Additionally, some specific projects and uses related to federal CARES and ARPA funds to support the ongoing recovery from COVID, as well as projects to address infrastructure, broadband, and affordable housing needs will be reflected in the budget as amendments are made throughout the year. Just showing the difference between our the $1.2 billion budget. $752,577,352 $752, in operating expenditures, capital roads and equipment at $212.8 million, $212 million, and transfers and other uses at $311.4 million. Our investment in capital continues in the proposed 23-24 budget, including uh, capital funding for parks 
environmental utilities and facilities projects, as well as equipment in about $7.8 million, and also road fund expenditures totaling $85.2 million. This 23-24 budget does reflect the addition of 74 funded allocations from the fiscal year 22-23 adopted budget. And here we have a chart of our projected general fund reserves at 153.7 million. See we have a general reserve of 69.5, that is our rainy day fund, which is a minimum of 10% of our operating expenses. Um, capital assets, our capital reserves at 53 million. We have money set aside in other for future projects for election systems and our PARS pension at 18.9 million, which will increase to 33 million at the end of the year once final accounting transactions occur. The 23-24 budget includes 173 special districts and county service areas. The total recommended budget is $41,023,070. It's a $6.8 million increase compared to fiscal year 22-23, uh, mostly due to increase in capital project and professional service expenses. So before I move into the requested actions, I do want to thank all the county departments, the county executive, and your board for all your support developing this 23-24 budget. I do want a special thanks to my budget team who's here with us today uh, for all their support and effort to complete this project or this budget in time. And we do, I do want to thank you, uh, thank you to Document Solutions and our POI office for helping us complete the fiscal year 23-24 adopted budget book for today's hearing, as well as your new budget at a glance uh, profi profile of the 23-24 budget for you today. So the requested actions for today include adopt a resolution, to adopt the fiscal year 23-24 budget, including budgets for county operating funds for a total of $1,276,837,090, and budgets for county proprietary funds for a total of $164,452,584. To adopt a resolution to adopt the fiscal year 23-24 budgets for lighting districts, lighting and landscape districts, benefit assessment districts, county service area zones, permanent road divisions and sewer maintenance districts governed by the Board of Supervisors in the amount of $41,023,070. And finally, to adopt an ordinance introduced on June 13, 2023, adopting the fiscal year 23-24 uncodified allocation of positions to departments and waive oral reading. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions the Board has. Okay, any questions from Board members on this item? Supervisor Gore. Uh, I don't have any questions, and I'm, we may not have a lot of public comment, but um, I have to say thank you to you and your team and really to boards that went before us to make sure that we're fiscally sound. This is a really large budget, but the fact that we're in a really strong place with reserves, um, that I have to say thank you to you, Daniel, really making sure that we um, changed our model a couple of years ago of really spending what we bring in versus um, spending on additional reserves from uh, from past years i think that's made a huge difference for us especially as we have so many capital projects uh, to address in the future and deferred maintenance that types of things so i i just want to th say thank you uh, because you've done a great job but folks before us have done a very good job and we are very fortunate as a county to be in the position in which we're in Thank you, Supervisor Gore. I, Supervisor Jane. Jane, <laughs> you're not a supervisor. <laughs> Join the club. <laughs> thank you, Board Chair. Um, thank you for your comments, Supervisor Gore. Um, I had a chance to thank Daniel and his staff and our broader CEO team and all the budgeteers across Placer last meeting, but it bears repeating because this was really, truly job well done. And I, too, want to thank uh, the amazing budget team uh, for all your participation and hard work. I know you, it takes a lot of work to put this together, and you've done a great job. Supervisor Jones? I would like to add to that as well. Um, thank you for all your hard work, and thank heavens for you <laughs> that uh, better you guys than us. I mean, we're good at managing it, but I don't think we could do the number crunching. 
anyway. And that big book you've got there, mm -hmm. you know, that would be good for a, you know, like a booster seat. <laughs> but <laughs> so it would help. I was, I was, I was thinking of my mother-in-law. She used, always used to drive with a big old phone book under her. You know, it's also really good paperweight. Well, that's true. It'll hold the office door open. Yeah. I wanted to thank you all for all your hard work. I know this can't be easy, and um, we really appreciate the support that you give all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone in the public wish to address the board on this item? So close. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. I think it's afternoon. Uh, not so. Uh, Mike Garavidian, I see there are three sen seniors left in the room. Uh, n none of them are women, just uh, guys. Um, so uh, I'm going to try to very quickly go through the area I'm concerned about, and that is the public works department, the way it's increased. Uh, and the background for this is just a kind of a test I'll be looking at about how the, the budget is implemented. First of all, Measure M in 2016 was the, the turned down by the voters. A million was spent to pass it. They didn't pass it. Um, and uh, so um, the, the, it was for $1.6 billion what was in there, and the Republicans, Republican Central Committee voted unanimously against Measure M. The Democratic Central Committee uh, needed 60%, couldn't get 60%, so it couldn't go on their door hanger, et cetera. Um, now, the, the, the PCTPA has kept polling, and they poll and poll and poll, and there, there isn't enough of a margin that it would pass. Uh, even, even to get it, to take it back on the ballot, even though the county got a change in the state law to allow it to, the vote to take place in the, in the cities and, and not the whole county. So to me, the test we'll be looking for here is, um, well, let's say, call it two tests. There's the tax and spend test. We have a government that's taxing and spending. Um, everybody understands that uh, and the transparency about that. But the other thing is the Reagan mantra infrastructure, about infrastructure, user pays when it comes to infrastructure. That, I mean, that's a, that's a key test. So, so let's look at the page, um, what is this? Page 52, it, it defines the uh, public works pr uh, spending there. You can see it, it doubled from, from the la in the last two uh, fiscal years, from 22 million to 45 million, and now it's proposed to increase another 15 million. And if this is going for Placer Parkway, which it might be, that's the wrong expense, and, but I think, I think that's the, the test we'll be looking for and the implementation, implementation of this is how much is being used to subsidize or, or do things that part of it's the bad planning that's gone on. There's no way that Placer Parkway, that, you know, if there's going to be transportation expending on the future, it should not be wasting it on projects that aren't going to relieve congestion. It should be figuring out what to do because all the development that's coming is never, and even what's here already, is not being, not manageable by the highways. Highways are not the solution. We have to figure out something else. And I don't, I don't know that there's anything like that in the budget. The studies that keep happening are like going out to 99 in different ways. And PCTPA was looking at one of the other studies to go out to 99, and they were looking at the potential cost to, to homeowners. Of, of, uh, one, uh, on one end, it was maybe $1,500. The other one was maybe $10,000 fees or homes. So uh, this really, you have to go back to the beginning and look over and figure out how we can do something to solve our transportation problems, not by wasting money, as, as I'm concerned about. Thank you. I see none, Chairman. What? Is your mic on? Yeah. Oh. I can't hear you. Sorry. I was not talking into it. <laughs> so, can you hear me now? Uh, seeing there's no other questions or comments from the board members, now the chair will entertain a motion. I'll move approval, and I will second. Okay. Uh, motion by Supervisor Gore. Landon. No. Landon. And second by Supervisor Gore. All those in favor, please say aye. Oh, roll call vote. Yeah. Jones? Aye. Gustafson absent. Gore? Aye. Landon? Yes. Holmes? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, board. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, team. Good job. Now we'll move to. I'm just trying to see if we're out here by noon. I don't think so. 
We'll move to item uh, 7F, the 24-7 tele telephone crisis services agreement with Nevada County Behavioral Health. Hello again. Hello again, uh, board. Um, this is Amy Ellis with the Adult System of Care. Um, I maybe can go a little slower this time <laughs> to get through my remaining items. I have um, an action requested to approve an agreement with Nevada County Behavioral Health to provide 24-7 telephone triage services from July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2024 in an amount not to exceed $821,068 and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to execute the agreement and to sign subsequent amendments not to exceed $82,106 consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. So we have been contracting um, since about August 1st, 2009 uh, with Nevada County Behavioral Health to provide cost effective and efficient and mandated telephone access and crisis triage services to the residents of Placer County. These services are provided 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They provide information, referrals, brief support and linkage to most of the services within the old adult system of care, such as the um, adult protective services, in-home support services, public guardian, substance use, substance use services, mental health and mental health crisis, of course. They also provide after hours child welfare and children's mental health services assistance. The organization uh, will play a critical role as we, we are mandated to move to 24-7 mobile crisis access, um, which is a mandate that's effective at the end of this calendar year, December 31st, 2023. They'll be able to help directly link our residents to mobile crisis services, the Lotus Center, and many other life-saving supports. Um, the triage services provided by this organization have provided an avenue to expedite access for callers um, by fielding about 23,254 calls um, last from July 1, 2022 through March 31, 2023, and they expected to have a total calls for this fiscal year of over 31,000. So a majority of the calls received to this line are directly for mental health related services for adults. But again, we, they receive a, a variety of other calls in addition as already discussed. So all of these services um, have been budgeted appropriately and there's no additional impact to general fund. Um, any happy to answer any questions about this service. All right, Supervisor Landon. Just a quick question. Is this tied in with 211? If someone calls 211, does it route through here or is there no connection there? Yeah, so basically we try to have a no wrong door approach. So people, if they call 211 and it is really for a behavioral health or one of these services where they're really kind of trained in, in how to link to these, then 211 will route them over to this call center and vice versa if people call this line but really it's a service that's outside of this scope then they'll refer them to 211 and for many people who might be aware 988 is also online um, we're also trying to work with um, the provider of 988 call center which is actually located in sacramento county to try to also have it be a no wrong door so they will also be routed to this line and receive appropriate direct linkage to service for um, if they dial 988. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, is there anyone in the audience wish to address the board on this item? Is there anyone online? I see none, Chairman. All righty, then we'll bring it back to the board for action. I'll move approval. A second. Motion by Supervisor Landon, second by Supervisor Jones. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? Hearing none, we'll move to item 7G psychiatric services services agreements with north valley behavioral health llc yes uh, amy ellis here again uh, two action items today first to an approve an agreement with north valley behavioral health llc for psychiatric services at their yuba city locations in an amount not to exceed 5.9 million dollars from july 1st 2023 through june 30th um, 2024 and authorize the director of health and human services to sign the agreements um, and assign subsequent amendments up to $100,000 consistent with the agreement subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. Um, the second one is to approve an agreement with North Valley Behavioral Health LLC for the operations 
of psychiatric services directly at our Kirby Hills location. That went in an amount not to exceed $4 million from July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2024, and authorized the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the agreement with risk management and county council concurrence and to sign subsequent amendments up to $100,000 consistent with the agreement's subject matter and scope of work and again with risk management and county council concurrence. So North Valley Behavioral Health, this is a continuing contract for us. We've been working with them for, for several years and they continue to serve our residents experiencing a behavioral health crisis and that require treatment at an acute inpatient level. Um, this organization operate, operates our Kirby Hills PUF, uh, which is a 16 bed location. And then, but they also operate two other locations in Yuba City that we are able to use if our, uh, if our location is at capacity. So by contracting with North Valley, we have additional access to, to, to inpatient beds that help to get people out of emergency rooms into stabilized situations and then we can move them back into community-based resources or to higher levels of care if needed. Because there's 16 beds or less, they are eligible to receive Medi-Cal reimbursement for those services, which is also a, a, a cost-saving um, way of treating these individuals versus um, at larger inpatient psychiatric hospitals. So the total cost of these agreements are uh, respectively 5.9 million for the Yuba City locations and 4 million for the, the local um, PUF that we have here at Kirby Hills. And the funding is available in our 23-24 budget um, and will be budgeted appropriately next year. And there is no additional impact to the general fund. Any, I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions, comments from board members? Supervisor Jones. Yes, good morning again, Amy. Um, you said 16 beds or less are eligible for medic Yes. How Medicaid? Look. Yes, exactly. So that is part of the IMD exclusion set by the federal government. So basically, any facility larger than 16 beds is not eligible to receive um, a drawdown of that that federal funding source and that those state funds that go through the federal government. So we're we're actually really been pushing to try to get that changed. Um, so because we are at a mental health crisis and we need more bed cap capability, but it was originally like instituted to just um, help counties really not just hospitalize long term and really really seek to to get them in the lowest level of care safe in their communities because it's best for the individuals we serve. Right, but you're fighting to get it so that more more than 16 beds is receive reimbursements? Yeah, just because of bed capacity issues more, but we still believe that um, short-term stays and as quick as possible into community-based um, care is best. True, but it would be extremely helpful if we could get larger facilities to, yes. to receive reimbursements, yeah. right? Yes, it would. What can we do to help? <laughs> well, we'll talk with Joel Joyce, our legislative guy. He's, okay. he's, he's on it. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, Amy, so much. Any other comments, questions from board members? I see none. Uh, anyone in the audience wish to address the board on this item? Seeing none, is there anyone online? I see none, Chairman. All righty, please. Uh, I'll move approval. I'll second. A motion to approve by Supervisor Jones, second by Supervisor Gore. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? Hearing none, we'll move to item 7H, Drug Medi-Cal Organized Delivery System Agreements. All right, bear with me on this one, board. Amy Ellis here again. There's a lot of action items with this one because it's going to encompass multiple contracts um, that are involved in our substance use continuum of care. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and start with them and list those action items, and then I'll tell you a little bit about them. So um, the first is to award a request for proposal uh, number 20355 to Granite Wellness Centers, Progress House, Incorporated, Aegis Treatment Centers, LLC, Recovery, Recover Medical Group, PC, and Wellspace Health for Substance Use Treatment Services. Second, to approve an agreement with Granite Wellness Centers for Substance Use Treatment Services from July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2025, in an amount not to exceed $10,449,558 and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to execute the agreement and to sign subsequent amendments up to $100,000 consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. Third, 
to approve an agreement with Progress House Incorporated for substance use treatment services in an amount not to exceed $2,223,865 for the period of July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2025, and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to execute the agreement and to sign subsequent amendments up to $100,000 consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. Fourth, to approve an agreement with Aegis uh, Treatment Centers, LLC, from July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2025, in an amount not to exceed $4.6 million, and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the agreement and to sign subsequent amendments up to $100,000, consistent with the agreement's subject matter and scope of work with Risk Management and County Council concurrence. Fifth, Approve an agreement with Recover Medical Group, PC, from July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2025, in an amount not to exceed $1,715,706, and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the agreement and to sign subsequent amendments up to $100,000, consistent with the agreement's subject matter and scope of work with Risk Management and County Council concurrence. And finally, to approve an agreement with Wellspace Health from July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2025, in an amount not to exceed $1,815,336, and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the agreement and to sign subsequent amendments up to $100,000, consistent with the agreement's subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. So, our, just briefly about these, the Drug Medi-Cal Organized Delivery System, it's a program that was designed and to organize the delivery of our healthcare services for Medi-Cal eligible, eligible individuals with substance use disorders. So um, interestingly, when we went to the Drug Medi-Cal Organized Delivery System, we were able to bill for more services in our residential facilities. Um, but in order to do that, we had to demonstrate to be organized, to uh, do proper assessments, and um, to be able to have an array of services that demonstrated we were putting people in the least restrictive environment. So we began providing these services since November 1st, 2018, and we are required to have this service array in order to participate. We have, from the inception, most of these people on your list, like Granite Wellness Center, Progress House, and Aegis, have been providing these drug Medi-Cal services. Wellspace Health and Recover Medi-Cal joined Placer County as service providers later in 2021. But through the request for proposals process number 20355, all five agencies were competitively selected and now moving forward to contract as partners for us in delivery of these services. They're modeled after the American Society of Addiction Medi Medicine, also known as ASAM. The criteria, this sets our criteria for placement and all of our staff and contracted provider are trained on how to utilize this evidence-based way of determining the level of care need. The primary goal of services are to provide eligible beneficiaries access to substance use and medication-assisted treatment services to provide a system of care that helps them achieve sustainable recovery and reduce substance use within our community. Providers use a minimum of two evidence-based treatment curriculums within their programs and are monitored to ensure compliance with the state and county guidelines by county staff. Our contracts demonstrate Placer County's continued emphasis on collaboration with our criminal justice partners, our human services department, mental health, and children's system of care as we leverage funding from those various sources and work together to create a treatment conti continuum that all can benefit from. Our total cost of these agreements is $20,804,465 that are budgeted over the next two years with those variety of contracts I just listed, and there will be no additional impact to general fund, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions uh, from board members? I we see none. Anyone in the audience want, wish to address the board on this item? See none. Is there anyone online? I see none, Chairman. All right. Then uh, it's time for her to make a motion. I'll move approval, Mr. Right. Chair. And I'll second. Super motion by Supervisor Jones, second by Supervisor Gore. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the item is moved. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks, uh, Amy. Now, Twyla, it's your turn. Good morning, still. And um, 
Fortunately, I don't have quite as many as Amy today, so, but I do have a couple. Anyway, so um, good morning, Chair Holmes, Supervisors, Ms. Christensen, Ms. Schwab, Twyla Abrahamson with the Children's System of Care. So the Children's Receiving Home of Sacramento has provided intensive trauma-focused services in an effective manner to three to six-year-old very young children in both a specialized preschool classroom setting and in the homes with their families for the past eight years. In the current fiscal year, they have successfully served nine Placer County children using intensive, effective trauma-based models. This program you may have heard of, we named it Sprouts. The specialized program has been very valuable in the community to prevent young children from developing more severe behavioral problems, interfering with their developmental milestones, and educational readiness for school. Referrals are made to the program from the Children's System of Care, Child Welfare, Behavioral Health, from foster care nurses, pediatricians in the community, and from the Early Head Start programs in Placer County. So we're requesting that your board take the following action. Approve an agreement with Children's Receiving Home of Sacramento for the period of July 1, 23 through June 30, 24 to provide intensive trauma-focused services to children aged 2 to 5 and their families in an amount not to exceed $569,261 authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the contract and to sign subsequent amendments up to $56,926 consistent with the current subjects, matter, and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. And funding is available in the fiscal year 23-24 budget and there's no additional cost to the general fund. So I'd be happy to answer any questions about this item. Any questions, Supervisor Jones? <clears throat> Good morning, Twyla. Good morning. Thank you for that. Um, could you explain to all of my constituents and give us an idea of what is intensive trauma? So intensive and complex trauma for these very young children, they may have um, had abuse and neglect, they may not. They may have had a parent die, they may have had a fire, they may have had multiple, a grandparent uh, pass away, movement from place to place. They may be some of these kids that have come to us from different countries even. So they just have trauma on top of trauma on top of trauma. And you can imagine at that early age, two to five year olds, they don't speak very well about their trauma. So they have to use specialized different types of work and play therapies in order to get them to process that trauma. Mm. So this is a very unique program. We started this a number of years ago, about nine or 10 years ago now. It was the result of an RFP at that time and we had one, one provider who was willing to go on this journey with us and they've stuck in there with us and, and done all the additional training to do it. So it's a very unique program in the region and even in the state. Is, how many children um, usually are kind of on an average, I guess, of all they, You know, over the year, maybe 10 to 12. I mean, it's a very intensive program, again, working with their families as well. And the ages that were young? Two. Two? Two to five. Two to five. That's really what it's targeted at. And again, so that they can achieve and change and hopefully improve their developmental milestones and their readiness for school. Because these children are the ones that end up on the... Um, a program before your your special ed your I, um, IEP program these are on programs that are even um, before that time which is why we work with the early uh, head start program as well so it's got a pretty good success rate I guess since we've yes persevered. yes it does and um, again we're not the only ones that that also uh, refer to it pediatricians and different other folks you would think that it actually be a lot mm -hmm. larger but because of the intensity of the program and the specialized nature of this um, it's been interesting in the region that not as many other counties have wanted to stand up a program like this. Mm -hmm. So I just appreciate our board's support for it because that has been one thing we've been doing for the last nine or ten years. You bet. And that's what the Sacramento Children's Receiving Home is doing. Well, the, it is because they are the ones that have the facility. Right. Yes, but they're doing it for Placer County. They occasionally take a Sacramento County child through their funding mechanisms, but we did start this program and we were really hoping it would proliferate throughout the region. I think I asked you before, why, what happened to our children's receiving home? So our children's receiving one, home, which was, uh, you'll hear me talk about it for the next five years anyway, but um, 
Senator Stone sponsored AB 403, which was um, part of the state mandates for congregate care reform. And so any county run shelter at that time actually needed to close, close their doors or they needed to transition partway through to a 10 day shelter only. And your board with uh, your direction and, and our recommendation closed it at that time because it was mandated by the state to do so. So all county run state or county run facilities um, that were emergency receiving homes had to close for that line of business. This particular line of business that Sacramento Children's Receiving Home is doing has nothing to do with the receiving home, has everything to do with this particular type of service. So did their portion of the receiving home that had the same service as ours, did they have to close as yes, well? Yes, they did, but they did in a different way. They were a privately run nonprofit. So they, they still operated for Sacramento County for many, many years. It was only about two years ago they did transition to that short-term 10-day shelter, but about two years ago, they did not contract with them anymore, and so they have run some different programs. They run also some short-term residential therapeutic programs, but because they were a private nonprofit, they didn't have to close on the same timeline that any county-run facility did. Right, so what was an average uh, stay? It was more than 10 days. Obviously. Oh, absolutely. Most most shelters were running at least 30 days, 30, 60, 90 days. But again, the one thing about congregate care reform is it really does have at its heart trying to make sure that kids are kept in their communities and out of like, they want to be in family-based sort of services. Unfortunately, we don't have enough of those. So it is, this is a totally separate issue that we could talk about for a long time, but it is creating a lot of placement challenges that you've probably seen in the media. Uh -huh. You've seen Sacramento, you've probably seen LA, that they are housing kids in hotels and housing kids in the former juvenile facility down in Sacramento. It is absolutely part and parcel um, of part of the, the congregate care reform. It's kind of like building the system, making the, the necessary changes before we actually had the community-based facilities in order to do it. And so it's still a struggle. That's a totally different topic, but it is no, I, related. I, I understand. Yeah. I'm sorry I'm <clears throat> no, not at all. you here, but so um, in the past, did we have a limit to how many days they could stay or was it unlimited? No, it was not unlimited. Okay. Yes, yes, but it was in 10 days. Yeah. It, it was supposed to strive for 30 days, and then you had to have ample reason for keeping them beyond 30 days to find a more permanent placement for someone. That would be giving people time to find maybe a family member or a neighbor or somebody that could handle that level. And some of these kids, remember, are... Uh, removed from their homes due to abuse and neglect, but not necessarily to do uh, to, with their own behavioral health challenges. That's changed quite a bit. So then my last question would be, what can we do to help? Right at the moment, I think, um, if we do end up in a situation that many other counties have, in which we have to have kids in unlicensed facilities, which is what you are seeing throughout the state mm -hmm. with kids in hotels mm -hmm. and kids potentially in offices and kids in, you know, uh, again, unlicensed facilities, just recognize much as LA County, their Board of Supervisors is doing is they are asking the state to make sure that they can uh, loosen up some of the restrictions and flexibility for licensed categories so that if we know that there's a place where a child can be safe for a few days, that they won't then be censured or sanctioned for doing so. Many of the folks that I've talked to, the social workers and their supervisors have said they feel like at least they can keep a kid safe in their offices if they have staff to watch them as opposed to having them out on the streets which is not going to be do any good for anybody so that would be the support that we would need if we end up in that situation fortunately and that can change any day at any time we have had very few kids that we have had to have uh, that type of staffing i think since we closed the shelter in 2016 i can think of six kids that we have had that situation with and it was for like a night or two and we were very creative with all of our community partners as well so we managed to even if they were not in a uh, they were not on the home you know they weren't in a hotel they weren't actually on the streets they were definitely in a home um, for as short a term as possible okay thanks so much Twilight. you're welcome supervisor landon I just wanted to say thank you. This is such an important program, and I'm a huge believer in early childhood interventions, especially when it comes to getting people before they fall off the waterfall. And so um, I just wanted to say thank you for your work on this. 
you. You're more than welcome. We have a great provider network, and this is a, a good program. Johnny, Executive Officer. Thank you, Board Chair. Twyla, thank you so much for bringing forward this important item in this critical, specialized work. You know, I had the great fortune to meet Jessica Waterford out of the DA's office, an HHS alumni in Yes, hand, yes. <laughs> um, and learn more about the critical work that she is doing in our public safety arena in this field. And just shout out to both of you. I, it's such important work. Thank you. We work um, very closely with the DA's office on with our MDIC, which is our multidisciplinary interview team. And Jessica has been a forensic interviewer. And yes, she did start at the CSOC um, alum, as you said. But we all work together here in Placer County, you know, for the needs of our children and families. And so even if somebody might have been a prior uh, person, we work very closely with Jessica and Mary Green and her team for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no more comments from board members. Um, anyone in the audience wish to address the board on this item? Seeing none, is there anyone online? I see none, Chairman. All right, you can bring it back to the board for action. I'll move approval. And I'll second. Motion by Supervisor Landon, second by Supervisor Jones. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, any abstentions? Hearing none, the item is moved. We'll now move to item 7J, Pacific Clinics, Clinics Services Amendments. Twilight Abrahamson again for the record. So since January 1st in 2009, Pacific Clinics, you will maybe know them formerly as Uplift Family Services, has been providing federally mandated intensive specialty mental health and therapeutic behavioral services for children and their families here in Placer County. They have provided shorter term wraparound stabilization and case management services as well. All of course uh, to um, any of them uh, also have been referred for formal intervention to help them remain out of the child welfare system. In April of 2023, Pacific Clinics responded to a request for proposal number 20370 for specialty mental health services, wraparound, and therapeutic behavioral services. Through a systemic uh, proposal and interview process, Pacific Clinic was not awarded to continue their contracts to provide these specialty mental health services. Through RFP number 20371, Pacific Clinics was selected to continue providing services to residents in the North Lake Tahoe area. However, they have since declined to continue providing these services. So to ensure needed services continue during these upcoming transitions, the county is requesting to amend its current contracts with Pacific Clinics. Through these amendments, Pacific Clinics will continue to serve vulnerable Placer County residents while transition of care plans are established. Clients receiving services from Pacific Clinics will ultimately transition to a new provider and will use this time to obtain medication refills, close services with their current treatment team, and establish with their new providers. In addition, with a little bit of background, these amendments are being sought to a change in payment methodology. Amy has mentioned a little bit about CalAIM, which is the Department of Healthcare Services implementing the statewide initiatives and CalAIM stands for California Advancing and in Innovating Medi-Cal. It includes payment reform. And payment reform itself is a multi-year initiative which will deliver value-based care through rates restructuring. This restructuring will allow the county to draw down increased federal funds as long as direct services to youth, families, and adults increases. To achieve this increase in services, which should improve quality of life for Medi-Cal beneficiaries, agreements have been amended to allow for the restructured payment methodology and increased funds for increased direct services. CalAIM also offers other reforms which should lead to reduced financial risk, more flexibility, and less complexity for counties and contracted providers. So for this set of um, amendments, we're requesting that your board take the following actions. Approve an amendment with Pacific Clinics to provide psychoeducational and specialty mental health services, increasing the amount by $190,000 for a new total amount not to exceed $2,098,412, and extending the agreement an additional two months for a revised term of July 1, 2023 through August, 31, 2020, uh, August 31, 2023. Authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the amendment and to sign subsequent amendments not to exceed $100,000 consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. The second action is to approve an amendment with Pacific Clinics to provide therapeutic behavioral services and specialty mental health services increasing the amount by 60,000 
for a new total amount not to exceed $628,350, extending the term for an additional two months for a revised term July 1, 23 through August 31st, 23, authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the amendment and to sign subsequent amendments not to exceed $62,000, $835 consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. And the third action is to approve an amendment with Pacific Clinics to provide mental health services in Tahoe, increasing the amount by $90,000 for a new total amendment, amount not to exceed $759,706, extending the term an additional two months from July 22 through August 31st, 23. Authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the amendment and to sign subsequent amendments not to exceed $75,970, consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. The increased cost of these amendments for the two months is $340,000, again for that transition of care. The funding amount is available in the 23-24 budgets for both the children's uh, system of care and the adult system of care, since this does include adults as well and there's no additional impact to the general fund. So I'd be happy to answer any questions about this item as well. Address this item. Seeing none, is there anyone online? I see none, Chairman. Already, I'll bring it back for action. I'll move approval. I'll second. It's been moved by Supervisor Jones, second by Supervisor Gore. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any abstentions, any no's, don't see it. Next, one last one. Yes, and so this will answer one of the questions raised by the last item, who's going to do the care? This will answer part of the question. So we are mandated, as, as you've heard already, by the State Department of Healthcare Services to offer these services to children and their families. So this full continuum of children and youth services for the entire county, with the exception of Tahoe, was the subject of request for proposal 20370 as a planned periodic review of services. Victor Community Support Services, Inc. was selected to provide intensive outpatient, intensive home-based wraparound, and the therapeutic behavioral specialty mental health services. Victor Community Support Services, Inc. is a nonprofit with more than 50 years experience working with youth and families. In addition, as you have heard very well and know, over the past several years, it's become clear that child and youth mental health issues have increased. A second provider who responded to the RFP, Wayfinder Family Services, formerly known as Lilliput, was selected to provide additional intensive outpatient specialty mental health services to meet this increased need. Wayfinder Family Services is a statewide nonprofit multi-service social service agency with more than 55 years serving vulnerable children, families, and adults including those involved in the child welfare and probation systems. So for this, we're requesting that your board take four actions. The first is a ward request for proposal 20370 to Victor Community Support Services, Inc. for intensive outpatient mental health services, wraparound and therapeutic before, uh, behavioral services. Two, a ward request for proposal 20370 to Wayfinder Family Services for intensive outpatient mental health services. Three, approve an agreement with Victor Community Support Services, Inc. for specialty mental health services for the period of July 1, 23 through June 30, 25 to provide intensive outpatient, wraparound, and TBS services in an amount not to exceed $8,545,000. Authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the contract and to sign subsequent amendments up to $100,000 consistent with the current agreement's subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. And four, approve an agreement with Wayfinder Family Services for the period of July 1, 23 through June 30, 25 to provide intensive outpatient services in an amount not to exceed 1,930,000. Authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the contract and to sign subsequent amendments up to 100,000 consistent with the current agreement's subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. The total cost of these agreements is $8,545,000 and $1,930,000. Funding in the amount is available for each agreement in the 23-24 budget, and the remaining amounts will be budgeted in the 24-25 budget, and there is no additional impact to the general fund. And like the prior items, if you have any questions, I'm happy to address those. Any questions, comments from board members? <coughs> I see none. Does anyone in the audience wish to address the board on this item? Seeing none, is there anyone online? 
I see none, Chairman. Alrighty, thank you. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> That's okay, I'll move approval. Motion by Supervisor Jones, second by Supervisor Gore. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? Hearing none, the item is moved. Thank you, Thank Twyla. you. Now we'll move to item 8A, salary adjustment, human resources. Good morning, I'm just <laughs> under the wire here. Just um, barely. It's, it's appropriate to be following Health and Human Services with all these important um, benefits and services that they're providing to the community. This item, I'm Nicole Lopez, the Assistant Director with Human Resources. And this item is to address the staffing of Health and Human Services related to the Client Services Practitioner Series. Recruiting and retaining qualified client services practitioners has been a long-standing challenge, which is further complicated by the COVID-19 pandemic and the increased demand for practitioners and mental health services. Many organizations, including health plans, are hiring more practitioners to address the increased need, which further impacts the ability for Placer County to recruit and retain uh, because of limited uh, resources in the marketplace. Placer County has significantly increased advertising efforts to attract qualified practitioner candidates, and the recruitments to fill these positions are on an open and continuous basis to maximize exposure and accessibility to potential applicants. Nevertheless, the number of qualified client services practitioner applications submitted continue to decrease while the need and the allocation, allocated positions are increasing. These master's level degree positions provide critical services to vulnerable populations, including social services and clinical treatment to clients with a variety of identified mental health and behavioral health needs. To best address the challenges the county and the Placer Public Employees Organization, PPEO, through a memorandum of understanding, agreed to conduct a classification and compensation study for the Client Services Practitioner Series. Based on the results of this study, vacancy rates, and difficulties filling these positions. County staff and PPEO completed a meet and confer process. Based on the outcome, the recommendation is to provide an equity adjustment of approximately 7% to a client services practitioner one, client services practitioner two, the client services practitioner senior, and the Health and Human Services Program Supervisor. This one-time market rate adjustment is recommended to achieve a greater degree of competitiveness in the current labor market and better position the county staff uh, to staff its vacancies and effectively provide social service programs to its citizens. The side letter agreement with PPEO Memorialize, memorializes the party's concurrence, is proposed for board consideration and approval. Similarly, the proposed ordinance serves to incorporate the recommended salary amendments into the uncodified schedule of classification and compensation ordinance. I'm available to address any questions that you may have regarding this item, and I also have Dr. Oldham here, Director of Health and Human Services, here to support this item as well. Okay, any questions from board members? Supervisor Gore. Just one brief comment. Thank you very much for the update, and it makes sense that we do this. We were in a meeting, Supervisor Holmes, last week when we were talking about the need for more mental health workers doing outreach in our community to the homeless, and we had conversation about folks with master's degrees or peer workers. And my comment was there are not enough people with master's degrees who want to do this work uh, because there are so many positions and not enough people. So it makes sense in order for us to meet our needs that we have to be competitive with our salaries. So I'm certainly very supportive. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other comments? 
from board members. Don't see anything. Uh, did uh, Dr. Oldham, did you have a comment? Uh, thank you, Chair Holmes, members of the board. Uh, Rob Oldham with HHS. Just wanted to mainly say, yes, uh, HHS, we're very much in support of this action. Um, as Nicole said very well, we've been struggling uh, on recruitment uh, across the department, but particularly for these client services practitioners positions. They're really critical. I think, as you heard, you know, some of the uh, some of the services that um, are provided. And so I wanted to say one thank Nicole and Kate and the whole uh, human resources team for all the work. Uh, uh, in, in getting us uh, here, but also thank our HHS team, and in particular, thank our practitioners uh, who've hung with us, uh, you know, uh, especially over the last few years and stayed and, and really done um, very difficult work, but really important work uh, for uh, for our community. So, one, I think, hope that this um, uh, we're, we're in support of this, and I hope this will uh, demonstrate to our, our staff just how much we value the work that they do. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Oldham. Anyone else in the audience wish to address the board on this item? Uh, seeing none, is there anyone online? I see none, Chairman. Okay, we bring it back for action. I will move approval of the item. I'll second. It's been moved by Supervisor Gore, second by Supervisor Jones. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? Hearing none, the item is moved. Thank you, Nicole. Now we'll move to item nine, procurement, jail facility maintenance. Mr. Brentwood. Good morning, Supervisors. Brett Wood, your Purchasing Manager, here today to request your board's approval of the award of a contract or the award of an RFP number 203830 with CGL Facility Maintenance LLC for jail maintenance for jail facility maintenance in the maximum amount of twelve million dollars for the period for a five year period from July first of twenty twenty three through June thirtieth, twenty twenty eight. Also requesting at this time your board's approval for the option to renew that resulting contract for two additional one-year periods, a maximum amount of two million five hundred thousand per year, and authorize the purchase manager to sign all required documents subject to departmental concurrence and available funding. As a bit of background for your board, the jail maintenance services are provided at the South Placer Jail and the Auburn Jail and have been outsourced since about 2012 to a contracting to a contracting firm. The last time it was up for an RFP was 2020, though that contract expires at June 30th of this year. We went through an RFP process. There were two firms that responded. The, the incumbent is the recommended firm based on the evaluation panel and the criteria that were established. We've negotiated a mutually acceptable contract between the parties. The average cost for jail maintenance services is approximately $2 million per year, and that includes the general repairs and maintenance as well as the preventive maintenance that's done. We do understand that over time inflation is going to chew into that number and have incorporated a $2,500,000 request on an annual basis for that. So, and that handles the unplanned repairs or unanticipated issues that have to be addressed. With that, happy to answer any questions your board may have. Any questions from board members on this item? I see none. Does anyone in the audience wish to address the board on this item? I see none. Is there anyone online? I see none, Chairman. Already. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, yes. um, any motion should also include number four, which is determination that the proposed auction is exempt from environmental review pursuant to CEQA guidelines, section 15301. All right. Thank you. Been moved by Supervisor Gore, second by Supervisor Jones. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the item is moved. We'll move to item uh, 9B, annual software licensing and support. Yes, sir. Again, Brad Wood with your purchasing department or procurement division. The request with you today is to approve the award of negotiated agreements with multiple firms for annual software licensing and support in the maximum aggregate amount of $3.8 million subject to concurrence from risk management and county council. Item two is to request the option to renew those agreements for an additional one year term, the maximum amount of $3.95 million. Item three is to approve the, the renewal for those agreements for an additional one year term in the maximum aggregate amount of $4 million and to authorize change orders and not to exceed cumulative amount of $100,000 consistent with our procurement policy and authorizing purchasing manager to sign all required documents subject to departmental concurrence and available funding. 
this is an item that we bring to your board on a fairly regular basis every three to five years this covers all of the software systems that we utilize at an enterprise level or at a department level where the cost is in excess of hundred thousand dollars to renew that either licensing or software maintenance we aggregate those just to make it a little bit easier for your board to see those and we've provided with this an attachment that reflects those agreements as well as what the projected costs would be for each renewal period these are utilized by various county departments to meet their operational requirements on an ongoing basis with that respectfully request your board's approval and happy to answer any questions any questions from board members uh, so departments can't do this by hand and save us four million dollars i'm just <laughs> kidding oh my goodness there's a lot of contracts yeah. and a lot of software that we use it was quite a lot but anyway thank you any other comments from questions from board members seeing none does anyone in the audience wish to address the board on this item do we have anyone online no chairman all right we'll bring it back to the board for action i'll move approval it's moved by Supervisor Jones, second by Supervisor Gore. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, any abstentions? Hearing none, the item is moved. Now we're going to move to item 9C from our supplemental agenda Con approval of contracts for shelter services to gathering in. Yes, sir. Again, Brett Wood with the Procurement Division. The items today with you are to approve a contract with the gathering in for operation of the mobile temporary shelter in the maximum amount of two million eight hundred and forty one thousand three hundred and four dollars from july first of twenty twenty three to june thirtieth of twenty twenty five subject to risk management county council concurrence and I'll authorize the county executive officer or designee to execute the contract and all required documents item two is to approve a contract with the gathering in for the operation of the congregate shelter in the maximum amount of three million ninety two thousand five hundred eighty dollars for the same period of time from July 1st to June 30th. Again, subject to risk management and county council concurrence and authorize the county executive officer or designee to execute the contract and all required documents. And item three is to determine the action requests are exempt from environmental review pursuant to CEQA guidelines section 15301. As directed by your board, we have negotiated, uh, we presented this item to your board. Your board advised us to return to the gathering in, negotiate an acceptable contract. We have done that. We have had um, very positive discussions with the gathering in at how to transition the services over from uh, the incumbent provider to the gathering in effective on July 1st. We've also had meetings with all of the stakeholders to address issues or concerns they have and have a follow-up meeting scheduled with gathering in tomorrow to address those issues and further ensure that we can continue to provide the exceptional service that we have been um, as, a, as an organization. With that, happy to take any questions your board may have. Any questions, comments from board members? Uh, seeing none, is there anyone in the audience that wishes to address the board on this item? Is there anyone online? I see none, Chairman. Uh, Supervisor Jones, you know. Nope, I'm just gonna make, make a motion to approve. Oh, already? All, all of the above, all three. I'll second. Okay, motion by Supervisor Jones, second by Supervisor Landon. Will uh, all those in favor please say aye? Aye. Any opposed, any abstentions? The item has moved. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Now we'll move item 10, Public Works lower seacline water quality improvement project <clears throat> okay good morning chair holmes and members of the board my name is greg keveny associate engineer with the department of public works tahoe engineering division i am here before you today to request the approval to award a construction contract for the lower seacline water quality improvement project I also have with me here Ryan Decker and Rebecca Tabor from our office. The project is located on what we call Lower Seacline Street, south of State Route 28 and Brockway Vista Avenue in Kings Beach. The project is one of the final phases of the Greater Kings Beach Water Quality Project that has been implemented over the past 20 years. This project will help us achieve the objectives of the overall watershed improvement project 
including attainment of our TMDL goals and Lahontan Water Board general permit requirements. The current condition of unpaved or poorly maintained pavement within a mere 200 feet from Lake Tahoe poses imminent water quality concerns. The primary objectives of this project is to address these issues by paving the roadways, formalizing existing parking spaces along the existing dirt shoulders, and installing water treatment facilities to significantly reduce sediment transport to the lake. This slide illustrates the project area in the initial design concept. State Route 28 lies to the north and the stunning Lake Tahoe lies to the south. The Seacline right-of-way is bordered on the west by California Tahoe Conservancy property and on the east by the North Tahoe PUD property. Additionally, the North Tahoe PUD sewer pump station is located in this vicinity. The original design sought to maximize water quality benefits while maintaining existing recreational access in the area. The project has a long history and as such has had numerous public outreach touch points over the years. County staff have engaged with property owners, interested community members, and partner agencies to answer questions and address concerns. The main areas of concern included mainly the desire for flexibility by neighbor agencies for future development, project parking designs, accommodation of a future shared use path, and operations and maintenance. Based on the invaluable input received, the county has further refined the project design. Notably, the project footprint has been significantly reduced, removing parking stalls from the east side to allow for the utmost flexibility in future plans. This revised design permits the establishment of a future 10-foot wide shared use path within the county's right-of-way. This forward-thinking approach ensures that the project's impact extends beyond environmental conservation, positively enhancing the overall quality of life in the area. This endeavor has been the result of collaborative efforts among partner agencies and passionate community members. Together they have contributed their expertise and dedication to ensure that the project design aligns with the overarching goals of protecting one of nature's most, most precious gems, Lake Tahoe. With that, I would request the board consider the following actions. One, approve the award of construction contract number 001325 to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, F.W. Carson Co. of Incline Village, Nevada, for the lower seacline water quality improvement project in the amount of $580,951.20 and authorize the Director of Public Works or designee to execute the contract and change orders up to $41,547.56. Consistent with Public Contract Code Section 20142 and the County Procurement Policy Manual subject to County Council and risk management concurrence. Two, determine the proposed action is consistent with the mitigated negative declaration for the Kings Beach water quality and stream environment zone improvement project approved by the Board of Supervisors on December 9th, 2008. Thank you. Any questions? Already, I have one question. How do you pronounce your last name? Kevany. Kevany, like Heavenny. All right, good. Uh, any other comments, questions from board members? Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to address this item? Seeing none, uh, anyone online? No, Chairman. Okay, I'll bring it back to board for like action. I'll move the approval of the item. Second. It's a move by Supervisor Gore, second by Supervisor Jones. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentious? Hearing none, the item is moved. Thank you so much. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. Mr. Kevin. <laughs>
All right, uh, that concludes the items on our agenda. We will now uh, uh, adjourn to closed session and uh, I'll have County Council lead us out. The board will now adjourn to closed session to consider three items of labor negotiations.
you, yeah. you know, I met that woman who does the child. Yeah. And I remember, it's all, it's oh just, my God. she's amazing, no. but I cannot. Uh, Okay, the board has returned from closed session and uh, County Council will report out. The board met in closed session to consider the following under labor negotiators. The first item that was considered was labor negotiations with the, the um, DSA. The board heard a report and provided direction on a 4-0 vote. On the next item, labor negotiations regarding PCDDAA. The board heard a report and provided direction on a 4-0 vote. On the final item, it was PC Lima. The board heard a report. No action requested or taken. This concludes the report out of closed session. And that concludes the business of the four of the Board of Supervisors on June 27th. We are